Um, so we are going to talk here about left atrial fluid simulations, and at the end of the day, we'll have the PhD defense of Jordi Mill. So we'll talk about Jordi's and left atrial appendages. So this is the the agenda of the day. So there will be several uh, talks um, online and in person. We are quite happy about the people, people accepting like to, to, to arrive here, to come here and to talk. I think it's probably one of the first times so many people working on this type of problems are just uh, talking together. So let me show you. Uh, we are part of UPF in Barcelona. Uh, our research group is called FISENS. We have uh, several postdocs, several PhDs, and, and developers for some time. Um, and we are part of a larger umbrella that is called Barcelona MedTech with other groups related to biomedical engineering in our department and touching most of the uh, most interesting topics in biomedical engineering. So back in time, quite uh, a lot uh, right now, I was participating in a European project that it was within the FP7 framework that it seems now really old. Um, and it was uh, aneurysm, a European project focused on cerebral aneurysms. And I was involved in the computational tools related to the analysis of the morphology of these, um, of these cerebral aneurysms, and also in running fluid simulations in here, and even inverse problems to estimate the material property, right? It was quite interesting to work with these guys here at, at UPF. And also there were kind of some devices like stands, coils, where you could use simulations to plan this kind of device implantation, right? So at some point, uh, I mean, I've been working in the heart and in the brain for a lot of time. So I was trying to work uh, for an ERC consolidator grant in 2015 on how to link the heart and the brain, right? And well, it came to me or to us, the people that we were working on this, our first idea, like working with people uh, data from old, and obviously this relation between the stroke in the brain and uh, atrial fibrillation in the heart. There was another idea more for young people, the influence of cardiovascular abnormalities in brain development, but now we are going to focus on the first one. And it was really because of this that we started to look into the left atrial and the left atrial appendage, right? So we obtained a national grant called Compilau, and, and basically here, we wanted to uh, develop computational tools to study the 3D morphology of the left atrial appendage and blood flow dynamics of left atrial appendage occluder devices. Like in cerebral aneurysms, it wasn't really let's invent something new. It was some tools that we knew for cerebral aneurysms to really apply them uh, for left atrial appendix. So it was already in 2015, 2016 that we started with this. We were quite lucky from the beginning to have nice uh, clinical collaborations. In this case, I mean, the people that are here for a long time, I mean, uh, this was data from 3D rotational angiography uh, from Alst in Belgium. Uh, with Dr. Tom De Potter and Etelvino Silva. There was a biomedical engineer working there in, in the hospital. So we started just finding out how interesting is kind of this structure, right? I mean, morphology-wise, it's quite surprising the variety and the heterogeneity of this shape among uh, different, uh, among the human population, right? And we have this classical uh, classification of cactus, chicken wing, wing socks, and cauliflowers that in the database that we had, there were a lot of cases uh, out of it, right? And, and we started just to play a bit with it, doing segmentations, then doing the 3D reconstructions, and I started to go beyond this classification 
and getting more objective and quantitative indices to characterize the morphology. We started with center lines, computing center lines here and there, doing some kind of visualizations of the length, uh, starting to compute transversal planes to the center line to characterize the ostium and, and, and all the different parts of the morphology. We initiated the pipelines, the patient-specific modeling pipelines, mainly with open source uh, softwares. Uh, the work uh, started by, by Andy Olivar is here with the segmentation, using mesh mixer, creating the, the meshes, then a lot of manual editing for the pulmonary veins and, and, and cleaning and remeshing using Gmesh for the volumetric meshes. And then at some point we were using different solvers and we've been using ANSYS a lot for it and then doing the post-processing in parallel. The, the initial boundary conditions that we were using, uh, they were quite, well, I mean, basic, no? I mean, in, in the mitral valve, we were using a certain pressures, I mean, uh, depending on the um, part of the cardiac cycle, uh, we were using kind of uh, rigid or, or, or no slip conditions in, in the left atrial walls. And, and so it was not really a specific to, to the patient. We didn't get access to ultrasound data of these patients and so on. Um, we started building kind of large populations of data. In this case, at the very beginning, the work of uh, Guadalupe Garcia Isla, it was uh, with idealistic left appendage, quite spherical, but we had different left appendages from, uh, that were realistic. And we started to have some kind of uh, visualizations that the clinicians were quite interested uh, because it was the first time they were looking into this in, in the left atria. This is quite old already. Uh, even some videos doesn't work anymore. Uh, <laughs> and, but it, it was funny to, to start with this. And, and I'm starting also to look jointly at the uh, morphology of the left atrial appendage and the hemodynamics. And, and it was really quite early even if it was published later, that we started to look at the relevance of the different parts, like the, like the pulmonary veins. Like not a lot of people were looking into the pulmonary veins here, right? And, and the influence of the pulmonary vein on the, the, the hemodynamics. And, and even we have started some, some works like synthetically generating different tubes and different configurations to look at, at, the, at the impact of this inlet configuration in the fluid simulations. And also even uh, tackling uh, left atrial appendix complexity, playing around with kind of original meshes, doing a smooth thing, and see if we could chicken we nice uh, a kind of uh, left atrial appendix from whatever shape. And I started to look at some interesting differences. Huh? But this is quite old things. Huh? Um, and we also uh, started working on this VIDA platform, on the virtual implantation uh, for the device uh, in a, in a, a web-based uh, platform where we could, from an image, uh, get the segmentation and then uh, visualize the image and the segmentation in the browser and also include uh, CAD models of the device to just virtually implant it so that the, the clinician could play uh, before the intervention with the device positioning, the size, and, and, and have a better idea on which would be the optimal device configuration. And with this device configuration, to start running simulations to really see uh, the potential of blood stasis. Uh, depending on the on the different configurations, and this was one of the earliest works uh, led by Ainoa Aguado, where we already uh, saw that, I mean, the, the flow when you have when you don't have a device, or when you have a device and in different positions and, and locations is quite, I mean, obviously the flow is quite different, right? And and the velocities you have. I mean, in, in some positioning like this one, really high velocities, quite laminar flow comparing to other positions where you may have some regions with low velocities, complex flow, 
meaning the determinants to generate a thrombus. Uh, and that was interesting to see that when the clinicians were playing with this kind of VIDA interface, the, um, the outcome, the, the simulations with this VIDA-based uh, device configurations were better. We finished this initial project and we needed to have new ideas to continue to have more funding. So we added some keywords that were kind of trendy at the time. Uh, basically, okay, let's continue with these interactive tools, but adding in silico planning training and virtual and augmented reality uh, and advanced learning. This was in 2019. And we started playing more and more with the visualization. This is a PhD uh, of Irum where basically uh, the cinematic rendering visualizations that now are available in Siemens, we are trying to do them or, or have similar quality uh, with open source tools. And I mean, this was generated yesterday by Irum and it's, it's fantastic. I mean, the visualization, I'm not sure it has really added value uh, to the clinicians, but who cares? I mean, this is, uh, sorry clinicians, um, <laughs> This is the left actual appendix from outside, and it's really cool to visualize this. You, this is not a segmentation. Huh? This is pure rendering uh, of the data, and I asked her because this, is, this was a CT preoperative, and this was after the implantation. In the end, I didn't put, sorry, uh, if you were around, uh, I didn't have time to include uh, a visualization that I asked her from inside, right, where you can really see if the device is properly uh, located, no leaks, etc. So it's really cool visualization. Can you accept a Pablo Gonzalez, please? Uh, and 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 this is the the last versions of Vida uh, that we have continued working, uh, and it's quite advanced. Let, let's, let me go. So you have the visualization, as I said, of the medical images uh, in a database. It's all secure with a login, etc., and, and then you can visualize the 3D geometry and you can see here the center line and, and you have the planes uh, perpendicular to the center line and some kind of visualizations of these planes that the clinicians like a lot. Um, and this is the characterization of, of this kind of um, diameters of this plane that they can use really to decide which is the optimal implant. And, and we, the, the platform gives some recommendations and, and then the clinician can really uh, get one device and, and play around, move it, uh, and select another size, uh, etc. right, before the intervention. And also, in the last versions, we also have a phenomenological model for the device deployment. Uh, just to have a, an idea and intuition and how the device will end up deployed, right? And we have ported this kind of platform to virtual uh, reality and to augmented reality. Again, it's not obvious to, to evaluate and to quantify the added value of these tools in the clinical setting, uh, probably for training, probably to some extent maybe uh, for collaborative works, for planning, it's up to be, demonstrated, uh, but certainly it gives a different point of view of the data you need to work with, and, and in particular, the, the clinicians, right? Uh, also, together with Abdel, uh, this is just another tool, uh, uh, like 3D printing, that a lot of clinicians like to play with these 3D printed models uh, before the intervention. and. We have been working also with advanced MR techniques like 4D flow MRI, just to look at um, uh, the flow, not simulations, but with real data that it can be helpful to, um, to validate our, our fluid simulations to some extent, right? And what about the uh, modeling part in this project? So I'm not going to say anything. I mean, no spoilers. I mean, we have the chicken wing king that we'll talk uh, later in the day. So it's up to him to explain you uh, a lot of things on this. I would just mention that we have even explored uh, thrombus in cats. 
this is just the images when you put in this kind of uh, generative AIs these days. I put cut, heart attack, thrombus, clinical sick cartoon, and it delivered this as new images. It's a bit weird, uh, but what we do is a bit weird. But you can see really the morphology of some cuts uh, of the left atrial appendage. This is kind of left atrial appendages of cuts. They are very different. Uh, between each other also, and, and we have some data control cards, thrombotic cards, we run some simulations, and, and it was quite interesting, the results we obtained, right? When we look at the literature, this is the only thing, and kind of a spoiler uh, from um, Jordis, uh, he created this table. When you look at the literature on uh, left atrial uh, fluid simulation, everyone is trying to do uh, his her best. But there is no consensus on what is the best configuration of inlet, outlet, boundary conditions, cardiac cycles, mesh elements, whatever. And most of the papers are run in very small data sets. So really, there is a lack of uh, rigorous verification, validation, and uncertainty uh, quantification on this type of simulations. And in fact, during the last year, there has been this kind of uh, initiatives from the FDA, from certain associations, this ASME, VNV40 guidelines, giving some ideas on how to build this credibility on, on, on the models in, in, in general. I mean, when you, a regular model, you talk about ASME and, and VNV40, I mean, I'm not sure if or oh, everyone we knew some years ago, really, right? But in the end, I mean, it's a set of kind of steps that you need to follow, uh, and, and some shouldn't be surprising, right? Verification, validation, and sensitive quantification, all modelers probably are doing this now in every work. Let's leave it like this. Uh, but what is interesting is really to define the question of interest and the, cost, the context of, of use. And it's not so obvious. You really need to think about how your simulations are going to be used and who are going to uh, use these simulations and for what. So if you follow these kind of guidelines, it helps a lot to define, uh, to, to, to define all the steps required for your simulations to build credibility and then to be able to be used in even certifications of these medical products, devices, and drugs. And this was really the genesis of this European project we are part of with a lot of companies and, and, and academics and, and, and clinician clinical partners, SIM cardio test. There are three use cases, uh, one on patient leads, catheters, and, uh, and we are leading the one on, on left atrial appendages and another one on drug efficacy and toxicity. But it's really to bring these models uh, to another step so that they can be used in certification uh, processes, right? So I'm not going to enter into detail, but really, I mean, this is what we are trying. Really improve patient selection, the optimization, personalization of the devices, and predict treatment response. No? In the end, we are building these patient-specific modelings with partners like Simula, uh, doing the sensitivity analysis uh, and, and, and verification. And, and really to optimize, minimize the risk of, of thrombus formation after implantation. So I'm not going to enter into detail because I, I'm getting uh, just late on time already in the first talk. Um, but we, we have built and, and uh, this kind of document for this verification and, and validation. And we have uh, iterated with a lot of different stakeholders to come up with a question of interest quite particular really around the device configurations that can produce this DRT, this device-related thrombos with um, quantified with certain quantities of interest, the cap, the velocities, blood flow velocities around the device, etc., and the different contexts of use, if you have more or less uh, data available for validation, to be used by device manufacturers in genius to improve the design, okay? Let me go quick uh, about it because uh, there will be other talks like by Simula where they will show part of this. Uh, we are using ANSYS, we are using the open source solver of uh, Simula, OASIS, and they will for certain uh, show 
uh, the verification and validation studies that they are doing uh, this, checking uh, mesh convergence, uh, a lot of experiments, time steps, is really the largest verification and sensitivity analysis of, of this type of, of simulations, okay? And also we are collaborating with people like, like the group of Ellen Roche at MIT to develop in vitro experiments for, for the validation, okay? So uh, currently uh, we are working on fin uh, ending this kind of design of the VMV40 for these guidelines, uh, completing these verification studies and, and working on starting the validation with these in vitro experiments and, uh, and the large database of, of clinical, uh, um, clinical cases that we have. And also we are trying to do dissemination of these uh, the simulations and build community. This is what we are trying today, right? If we have these simulations that are credible, we can do a lot of things. I mean, we have already results uh, with different device configurations uh, uh, and, and devices from different manufacturers, and this is super interesting. Uh, we are also uh, building surrogates of these simulations with advanced machine learning techniques, this geometrical deep learning, um, to have faster uh, idea of the risk of thrombus, and also we are putting together the uh, morphology morphological and in silico indices into unsupervised clustering techniques that are helping us to identify which are the more important parameters for the risk of thrombus or not, right? So, I mean, just some of take home messages is like this kind of verification, validation, and certainty quantification is a bit boring sometimes. I mean, and it can be endless job. Huh? I mean, the people from Simulan here at UPF must, must say. Sometimes even difficult to publish, but it's very useful. It's very useful for the clinical translation of these tools. Uh, in the end, this exercise of the VMV40 is valid for any computational technique. Huh? And, and, and it's interesting really to use this kind of difference of open source and commercial software, okay? But really, we need to try to work together, uh, the different labs uh, worldwide working on this and set up standards, work together on benchmark data, and help each other, right? That's why we are doing here, right, today. So to all the speakers I'm going to talk today, that there is a lot of open questions, right? I mean, hopefully we'll have some time for debate at some point. But there are a lot of methodological challenge, uh, challenges that we all face, and, and that's important to talk about it uh, today and, and in whatever forums. Um, and, and, and insist on the need for a standards, benchmark, uh, clinical data availability and sharing. Uh, uh, I mean, we need to talk about this, the integration with machine learning techniques, and again, how we can work together, okay? So that's basically my talk. Uh, now I hope, just uh, thank you a lot for the gang, Sin Caritas, uh, Lao Gang, uh, and the people in the lab. So this is the plan today. We'll continue uh, with Abdel, sorry, I ate, uh, uh, five minutes from your talk. So uh, if you have any questions, it's okay. Uh, we'll have them at some point later because I'm already out of time. Uh, Abdel, it's your turn. So, thank you. I need to switch uh, something, right? Wow, 28 people connected online. That's not bad, huh? Thank you all. Good morning. Um, thank you, Oscar. I mean, coming here to Lao is like coming home. Okay. Um, we work with these guys all the time now. Um, uh, my name is Abdel. I'm a cardiologist. I'm a, an awesome imaging uh, specialist. I, I do my main, my main field is uh, structural imaging planning, which will let us study. And um, I work in Plaza San Paulo. It's very nice to go and visit if you're here. Um, and my, 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 my talk to you today is just sharing um, our clinician point of view, you know, uh, which tool we use usually on a daily basis, and usually what we ask, you know, for our uh, workflow, you know, and um, a bit our um, like a small intro, a sensitive planning, as like like a small case presentation, and remaining challenging was less appendage, you know, to give you more work. Yeah? Um, 
Well, of course, you know, let's let happen occlusion is, is, this is our main talk. Usually it's a, is a, is a, the therapy, the non-pharmacological therapy for fibrillation stroke in patient uh, with atrial fibrillation who cannot take oral anticoagulation, usually because they have hemorrhage and then they cannot use it, so you have to have a, give them another option. Because in those patients, usually are very fragile, very comorbid, and, and uh, so um, this is, the is the occlusion um, therapy is, is, um, is now we use it more and more. Right? Um, as you know, the anatomy of left appendage is more than me. Right? Um, it's very uh, variable and not much for, not for like uh, from the usual, uh, from the which, no? And also all the pre procedure imaging is, is very important and paramount to, to that. If you don't have imaging, we don't have 3D, we don't have anything else, no? um, What is the optimal left atrial appendage occlusion, no? I am not an interventionist, no? Um, of course, the interventionists want to have the best results for our patient. You need to have a complete seal. If you don't have complete seal, we, we already fail. If the patient has to continue taking anticoagulation and having a, an occluder in, his, in, their, in their left appendage, it's a very expensive device with no, with no benefit. So you still have, the patient has to still have taken anticoagulation. Because our patients are very um, fragile, we try to avoid general anesthesia. So usually you don't have a lot of guidance within the, 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 the no, you don't have within the, the procedure. So you have to use like micro, um, micro transesophageal echo or intracardiac echo, or you do some image fusion, no? So you have less support. So you, do, you need to do all of pre-planning. Also, you want to reduce the procedure time. Less time you do, less radiation you use, less contrast you will use. And of course, always you have to reduce your cost, no? If you have a very good plan, you want to avoid changing device, uh, losing less catheters and less contrast. As we said, our patient in left at appendage occlusion are very fragile and very uh, and have a lot of comorbidities. This is, um, you can say, our, our ideal workflow. No, working together with clinicians, um, the imaging the imaging uh, team, and also the structural heart um, interventionist. Always, you have to know your patient first. Our patients are unique, um, and also their anatomy. You have to do very good. You have very good, you have to have very good pre procedure plan. With CT or echo, you will talk about that, but usually it's mainly it's now CT. Try to plan, do a very good plan, also try to predict what complication you might see, no? And in some, and, and some patients you need to do a lot of simulation, no? Try to, uh, as, try to operate the patient before going to the theater, no? If you have 3D printing, if you have a virtual simulation, whatever you can do, um, try to do before, no? All, all those tools, you have to take, take advantage of them. And also this, those, those tools, you have to also take a, to the theater, no? To, to give support within the, during the, the, the procedure. And also, it's important to do the follow-up. Why doing the follow-up is important so we can learn where we, you know, how we can optimize our result. And if we can close this loop, it's the perfect way to work, okay? And we're not going to do a um, CT versus echo. You know CT wins, so that is no, no? Mm -hmm. okay. um, CT um, provide, um, a lot of, of information, um, not only to study the morphology, also to see the heart and outside the heart. And um, this is the consensus um, in 2019. And what are the steps you need to do uh, when we're reading a, a SCP for, for, uh, for, uh, for planning? This is the workflow. Usually, the first thing you have to do is look at the CT and see if you have, you know, um, you have, it have, um, uh, to rule out the uh, lead like thrombus if he has any extra cardiac stuff. No, sometimes you find tumors from some things. No, we do all patients are very, uh, very sick. You have to do an image segmentation. Of course, segmentation is, is the first, first step. And then you do the left at uh, 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 morphology and the surrounding structure, doing the measurement, device selection, try to see what is the best trajectory to do the transceptor puncture, to do a simulation of the best, you know, the fluoroscopy, the fluoroscopy CR angle. And if you have all the fancy stuff, also you can use them. This is a no, to see what I was saying. We need to see what is the added value for that. This is a lot of work. So we, usually we have 30 minutes or 20 minutes to do a, a, a report for each patient. So doing all this is very nice, no? but it's, very, it's things to take, on top, to take into account for the solution we want to provide. No? What software we usually use? Those are the commercially available and the FDA and CE marking software. No? For, left, for left atrial appendage, we have two and um, you can have it installed on your computer or workstation at, at, at work, is you have the inlight left at appendage uh, occlusion planning device, and you have Trimensio. I think Trimensio is the one that is the most used one. 
in like a small 3D modeling base and three yeah, dimensional. More, more than material, more than yeah, I think the the star for for structural heart disease man, is a three man okay. and because uh, I think material is just uh, they, they they joined like a year ago now, right? and also we, we have the multi-purpose software you can you can do basic uh, uh, planning for for left uh, left atrial right appendage um, uh, occlusion, no? and of course you have the online platform like uh, the hard guide form of Phelps that you can suggest you just have to do submit your city, pay some fee, and then in two or three days you get your, your planning. No? Um, this is our, what, if you don't have a dedicated software, eh? if you don't have, no, this is what you have to do. You should know that for each device, you have to do a different planning. If, if you have AMRED and you have Watchman, and if you have even more, so you have to, for each device, they have their own um, um, standards on how to determine the the, the ostium, how to, do, to determine the, the the landing zone, and this can is, is time consuming. It can take you like 10, 15 minutes, depend how you land. This is only to find the ostium, eh? without you haven't done anything else. And of course, now every time we have much much more um, devices to to take into account, eh? only also for planning. Um, this is like from the mimics in light. The first step is segmentation, and as you know. To have very good segmentation, you have to have very good quality CT. If you don't have very good quality CT, all this is, a, is a, the, the crucial step. And this step also can take you depend. Now some of them they, they integrate AI to accelerate the segmentation. No, this, this this is a very crucial part for the first step. And then you can the, the cool well the cool thing about, of course about 3D modeling it can give you very very a lot of visual. Um, uh, and an easy to an easy step by step um, uh, approach, and you can do deployment, very simple deployment of the device, you know. But you see, you have no deformation, you don't have flow, you know. So this this part is um, is is very basic, but also can give you an idea for how the device will be in, in relation to the ostium and also to the. Sorry, I'm getting a WhatsApp that people online are having difficulties hearing. I don't know if you can get closer. Uh, okay. A battery like this or no? Can you hear us? I think because you, before you had your own. Um, your, your, let me see. No, 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 Can we open this one? Let me see. Hello, hello, hello. No, no, no. So this is the one. Um, and also, um, it depend on the orientation of your left at appendage. It's not important to so you can so you can predict your the catheter you want to use. No. And the C arm um, angle is is, is is very important. is um is an add-on you can give your 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 interventions so you can know which is the best projection to do to be uh, per, no um, coaxial with your ostium. And of course, three printing. Three printing. We we use it at some point, especially for like more complex uh, cases like you have a um, very huge um, little appendage or for, for with, uh, with, with, with very peculiar anatomy. Um, and you can do a simple deployment, no. Uh, this is me actually. It's not the intervention, no. Uh, I did the deployment. Now you can do the deployment in a, in a, in a more flexible, and more rigid uh, material, and um, and you can know. You see how this was actually under under expanded. You have a very huge leak. Eh? But I mean, you can. This is uh, depend on 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 the setting. Some some our interventionists they some, sometimes they ask us for for a free print, in a very uh, few cases, uh, to try to uh, to. Uh, Try to do the deployment beforehand, um, and also with the same software with Materialize. Now they have an online platform where you can upload your uh, your, your planning, and also the, you can have um, access to an AR or VR um, uh, visualization of your of your uh, uh, of your planning of your 3D model. All of this is is all add-on. This is like Oscar says, very cool and very nice. No, we still want to find uh, the real. Uh, Clinical utility of it, um, but 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 for sure for for teaching and sharing with the patient and sharing with your colleagues and fellows and and this has a lot of value. Yeah. This is value is very hard to, to quantify, it, but it's it's very it's very important if you have all the, all the tools uh, uh, included in your clinical workforce for daily use. No, it's very easy to do it like this. No, uh, the, the thing we've been talking about is when you have a three D model, sometimes it's very hard to take it to your hololens. This would simplify all the steps. And also all the segmentation you do, sometimes also you can take it into your theater. No? So 
if all the planning and you can do image, image fusion uh, of the 3D model or, or the, all the segmentation. This is depend on your format Philips, they have hard navigator and you can, you can export the STL or the segmentation and you can, uh, you can um, uh, co-register it with the, you know, with the, with the, with the fluoroscopy. And as you know, that, 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 uh, the, the big problem with this is the, it does not register with the heartbeat, so it's, it's, it's fixed. No? But at some point, it can give you an idea, the location and the, and the geometry. And this is uh, actually this is the same patient. As you see, uh, this is the predicted and how, the, how this is the, the actual procedure. Um, with the cutter inside the, inside the left, this is a, is a watch flex, And you see how, how the deployment and then the detachment. Um, and also, when, of course, now we uh, already um, uh, Oscar talked about it. How we can include um, the, the the virtual reality uh, platform, and also you can do the simulation now, um, with Carlos. Like you know, I'm sure I'm sure Oscar and you know, and and Jordi will talk more about it. Um, what are remaining challenge for you guys to help us to solve? Okay, <laughs> with all those. Uh, city planning, I think we still have problem. We still have a problem to deploy our, our devices. No, we have two major clinical problem. One is um, per, per device leak. No, um, as you see, um, you can see, no, as you see here, you have this is the the, the one one you have a, a leak around. Uh, the, the device, and it can be between zero to five centimeter, five millimeter, and more than five millimeter, no? And also the device rated thrombosis. This is another thing we still need to, to, to address. Um, I think we all have almost the same percentage. For example, this is recently published, um, the registry was almost five, 51,000 uh, device is almost 24.7% of those patients had, uh, um, had um, a per device leak, and some of, only 0.7% had more than five, five millimeter, and it showed that patients who have leak even more than zero millimeter, I mean more than 0.1, they have more, more prone to have complication. The patient who had more than five millimeter did not show any difference because they continue to have their anticoagulation therapy, even though they have the, the device included. So we still have a lot of work to do. No? Um, now, with all, does all this um, 3D modeling, procedure planning, and advanced visualization and silica simulation, does it bring any clinical benefit to our patient? No. Uh, this, is why, why, no this is why we want to do this, because we want to improve our, our patient quality of life and, and, and less complication. No? And um, until recently, um, the PREDICT LA trial is, I think, one of the few uh, clinical trials been, been, uh, been conducted in a month, no? It's uh, prospective and multi, uh, and multi center uh, trial where they compare standard cardiac analysis, it's very basic analysis, versus, versus the, the, the one, the patient specific city simulation planning done on, on FAO's heart, heart, heart guide, no? I didn't get a chance to, I think they didn't publish yet the paper. I think this is just uh, in TCT 2022, they shared the slides. Um, and they show better procedure efficiency. The patient who, uh, sorry, the patient who um, uh, uh, achieved uh, such, no, the implementation without complication is um, with the city simulation group. And single device de deployment, 58% group of the city simulation planning. And um, on a less saturation, less number of device repositioning, you know? So it means some added value to the, to the standard of care. It, it seems it has, it, has, it has benefit. And not only that, it also has, like in, in from the point of view, um, clinically, you know? Patient who um, uh, done the simulation based city simulation planning, they had, um, Less DRT and, and less and, and a one or a single device deployment with complete left at appendage closure. As a take home message, I mean, uh, first the CT and of course our patient. No, if you don't have a good CT patient, we, we don't have 3D. So you know, this is very important. 3D modeling can help plan, predict, simulate, and guide and reassess. 
Yeah? And um, the more complex is our procedure, not only less of image, the 3D will have more added value. Because um, I cannot see we do planning like fails for each city we do, no? Um, and also, we need smarter and faster and dedicated software solution for you know, that can be integrated in our clinical workflow. You know? And the clinical, I think, that the, the important is actually you need to work together always. No? And biomedical engineer, imager, and clinician with the patient in the center. Um, with our experience with Oscar and, and their team, we are very happy you know, to have them always you know, close and close to the patient is where we actually always can get uh, better results. No? And of course, Jordi, this picture was behind. <laughs> Before PhD, <laughs> and this picture <laughs> just before. Uh, I think uh, clinically it is not very recommended eh, that having PhD. So <laughs> and actually, this is one of the first pictures with Elena and, and Jordi when they were like almost three years ago. Um, and, and good luck. And thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Juan Carlos, you can just start coming here and see if we can manage to make it work. Any questions to Abdel? No? I mean, we are extremely lucky to know clinicians that are a bit geeks and techies. That's not always the case. But if you have 30 minutes to do the segmentation, the morphological analysis, the virtual reality, the augmented reality, the simulations, I don't know, it doesn't fit very well, right? <laughs> I mean, 30 minutes for all this, uh, it's a bit tricky, no? It's, it's, it's very tricky. This is the importance of having like um, uh, realistic solutions. No? Maybe for, for daily basis, we don't do all of this. Of course not, no? But for, um, uh, from the in light, at least they have like a, uh, no? They have those sol solutions that they have step by step until you get to the, the end result, no? And then everything is automatically um, uploaded to the to the to the cloud, and you can have access to the VR or AR. You know? But 30 minutes, and also you still have the viewer reporting and uploading the document. You know? So it's, it's very few time. This is why we need your help. All right. So today I'm going to talk about um, how we're using multiphysics uh, uh, patient-specific models to get a little bit of an understanding of how uh, fibrotic uh, tissue remodeling affects uh, the um, hemodynamics uh, in the atrium and the risk of thrombosis. This is a large, uh, a large uh, team effort from several institutions, including my own institution, the University of Washington. Uh, the key PIs there are uh, myself, Pat Boyle in bioengineering and Nosem Akum in electrophysiology the Medical University of Graz, where Christophe uh, Agustin is helping us a lot with the biomechanics model. Uh, University Carlos III in Madrid, where uh, they have developed a wonderful immersed boundary uh, method solver for the, for the flow that uh, Oscar will be talking about uh, uh, in a couple hours. Uh, Hospital Gregorio Marañón in Madrid, uh, with Javier Bermejo and Pablo Martinez de Gaspi, and the University of California, San Diego, my previous institution, with Elliot McLeod and, and, and Andy Kahn. Of course, uh, we all know what the problem is here. Uh, uh, Left atrial dysfunction uh, triggers the formation of, uh, of thrombi and, um, and um, embolic strokes. Uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, actually uh, uh, draw your attention to the fact that not only atrial fibrillation is associated with, with strokes. There's uh, about uh, uh, almost uh, between 20% 20, uh, 20 and 30% of, uh, of embolic strokes uh, are caused uh, by, by um, mechanisms or a process that are not entirely um, uh, known at the time of the diagnosis of the stroke. They're called ESOs, em embolic strokes of undetermined source, uh, but they're highly suspected to be cardioembolic. In fact, many, many uh, uh, people discover the atrial fibrillation uh, after an embolic stroke of undetermined source. And as you know, mo mo uh, most of the thrombi form in the appendage, which is this hooked Sack there in that uh, echo image, and, and these, these clots are, are t tend to be large, and they, they actually uh, cause very severe strokes. Um, as you know, the, the current st standard uh, in, the, in the clinical uh, setting to, uh, to decide whether to prescribe anticoagulation or not uh, is not patient-specific at all. In, in patients with atrial fibrillation, they use this CHATSVAT score, which is based on demographic factors. Um, 
not personalized at all and uh, has relatively modest accuracy. And in ISOs, there is actually um, not even a clear criterion, but there are large, uh, large medical trials like Navigate trial that show that there's no benefit in, uh, in indiscriminate uh, anticoagulation because of the increase in incidence of bleeding events. So there's really no, uh, um, a huge uh, need for a personalized um, um, assessment of, of, uh, of uh, uh, thrombosis and, and, and thromboembolism in this patient population. And uh, there's been uh, quite a few attempts at understanding uh, or linking the risk to, uh, to the anatomy, the, the shape of the appendage uh, in particular. And those have improved the, the accuracy of CHATVASC when used in conjunction with CHATVASC. Another uh, potential uh, personalized image-based um, piece of information that we could use in the puzzle is to actually use fibrosis. And fibrosis is clinically available uh, by um, uh, late adrenaline enhancement uh, cardiac magnetic resonance. This is uh, coming from a paper from the Utah group where they kind of uh, uh, put together this technique. Um, uh, fibrotic regions which show in green and yellow here in these maps uh, in, the, in the LGE MRIs are typically associated with decreased uh, action potential uh, propagation, which is those pink, uh, uh, well, those reddish and, and yellowish regions here in the electrical activation maps. And it's known for a while that, uh, that uh, these fibrotic regions also have uh, reduced um, strain. Of course, the, the clinically, there's a, a, a strong association between the fibrotic burden and the, and the incidence of, of atrial fibrillation and stroke. This is data that shows, us, shows that uh, pretty clearly, but the underlying causes are not well understood, and uh, that's where uh, we're trying to uh, um, come at uh, 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 with a combination of uh, uh, multi-scale modeling and, and imaging. And our hypothesis is that uh, these multi, -hypoth mul multi physics computational models can help us understand a little bit more in depth the mechanistic uh, reason for, for formation of thrombi in these uh, patients and hopefully also help predict uh, clotting risk in a more patient specific manner. The, um, the types of solvers that one uh, typically uh, uses for this type of problems come from uh, a time-resolved, uh, ideally time-resolved uh, CT or MRI uh, that you can actually uh, analyze to get uh, the motion uh, and the geometry of the left atrium, um, inflow in the pulmonary veins, uh, that you can even infer from mass conservation principles if you also have the ventricle uh, segmented or using Doppler, um, maybe uh, uh, transesophageal Doppler that gives you uh, some of the pulmonary veins. Um, then you input that into a flow solver. You get your velocities, your pressures, resistance time, stasis, whatever you want. There are a few limitations with this type of approaches, uh, mainly that uh, you typically get one, one uh, bit data, which is not entirely uh, representative in patients that have an irregular rhythm. Uh, another um, uh, limitation of these approaches with, um, is that many patients have, have this, uh, what is known as paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation. So they go into atrial fibrillation and they come out of it. Um, so in a sense, you kind of have to be lucky to image them when they're fibrillating. Uh, um, so it's, it's uh, uh, pretty common that you take a patient with paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation to the magnet or to the CT uh, scan and they're in sinus rhythm when you image them. And then what do you do? Um, but ultimately, uh, these type of approaches do not really come close to understanding the, how the tissue biomechanics uh, affects the, the um, hemodynamics and, and do not provide a great way to understand the mechanistic implications of tissue injury in, in the hemodynamics and the, in, and the thrombosis. So what we're doing to tackle that is um, to replace the, the time-resolved CT images by a biomechanical model of uh, electrical activation and contractility in the atrium. Um, we, we are doing what we call one-way coupling. So for now, uh, what we do is we run this model using patient-specific images uh, of the atrium that include the segmentation and also the, uh, the, fibros the fibrosis maps obtained with LGE MRI. And then in the fibrotic regions, we modify the um, um, 
passive and active uh, mechanical properties of the myocardium, input that into our uh, solver, we get the, and the simulated wall motion and we feed that into our solver. Uh, our next step will be actually also considering the two-way coupling with fluid structure interaction. That's uh, one of the directions we're working on. Um, today I'm gonna focus mostly uh, in my talk in the biomechanics part and the implications. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the flow solver. Oscar will, will uh, talk uh, uh, in a few, in, yeah, in a couple of hours uh, about it. This is a flow solver that he developed together with Manuel Garcia Villalba at the University of Carlos III in Madrid, uh, which is based on the immersed boundary method and, and works really great. Uh, regarding the, the uh, potential propagation model, uh, we have a multi-scale model uh, that considers the fibrotic regions from uh, LGE MRI at the organ scale imports uh, the local orientation of the uh, myocardial fibers from, at from ATLAS databases into uh, using a unified uh, or universal coordinate system into, the, into the each uh, atrium. So the fiber orientation is not patient specific. It's based on you know, ATLAS's, ATLAS data. And um, in, uh, this wraps the, or modifies the properties of these fiber orientations uh, in, fibro in fibrotic regions. And then we also have a model uh, of uh, uh, electrical anti activation and propagation at the cellular scale that we can also tune between normal tissue and fibrotic tissue. Uh, we put that together with a biomechanics uh, solver and uh, where the imposed loads are pretty much the, the blood pressure from the atrium that is coupled with a zero D uh, uh, lumped parameter model of the circulation, uh, like uh, CircAdapt. And um, what, we do, what we do here is we modify the passive elastic stress uh, uh, strength relationship and the active uh, elastance, uh, time dependent elastance of the, of the fibers according to, uh, to the uh, fibrotic uh, distribution. Uh, we've been doing a, a number of studies where one of them uh, were or the first study that we, uh, that we consider um, took healthy uh, segmentations like the one that you see there on the left and used diffeomorphic uh, um, uh, transformations using this unified uh, coordinate system to impose uh, patient specific distributions of fibrosis from, from fibrotic patients into this healthy uh, atrium. And then we looked at the effect of, of that in, uh, in the hemodynamics and, and, um, and the, and the and me met metrics of uh, stasis and thrombosis risk. So this is the kind of uh, results that you get from the biomechanics uh, simulations, where you see the baseline on the left and what happens to that healthy baseline uh, atrium if you add 20% fibrosis from a, from a patient case, and those are actually shaded in gray here, the fibrotic regions, or 30% fibrosis. And uh, on top you see the electrical activate, uh, on top you see the, po the posterior uh, view and, the, and uh, at the middle uh, row you see the, um, the anterior view of the same atria. What you see with the colors is the electrical activation map and the motion gives you the, the wall deformation. At the bottom you see the atrial volume versus time and you see that actually the variation of volume with time decreases as you start adding fibrosis. When you look at these plots carefully what, uh, or these movies carefully actually in this particular case, the changes, the, the largest changes occur at the ceiling or the, the roof of the atrium, um, which is actually indicated by these red arrows there. Um, the flow um, in this particular case looks like that, and the type of results that one gets, and this is kind of a constant in, in what we see, is that, uh, well, here, just for your... Uh, for your um, Reference, what we're doing is we're coloring the, the velocity vectors uh, according to their, uh, their proximity to the uh, mitral valve, uh, pulmonary veins, and, uh, and appendage. Then the, um, and then at the bottom, what you see is the act actually the appendage. So in, w a constant in this type of uh, simulations, let me go back um, for a second there, is that the flow patterns? The flow patterns in the body of the pen, uh, in the body of the atrium, don't actually change quite, uh, a lot. It is the the blood the blood flow patterns in the appendage will actually uh, change more, um, um, and that translates into differences uh, in residence time in the in the appendage, which, as you know, is associated uh, with the risk of thrombosis because it's one of the three legs of the Virchow triad. Uh, stasis is, is, I mean, and um, 
this particular case, what, we, what you can see is actually as you increase the fibrosis in the atrium, the residence time increases. Oops, let me go back. Um, and you see some more statistically uh, rigorous analysis here than, than this plot, okay? Um, but of course, this is a very multifactorial process, so uh, what we're trying to do right now is to get a little bit of a, a more detailed analysis of what specific factors uh, uh, cause these changes, okay? We, we have shown that fibrosis indeed leads to an increase in, in um, in stasis in the ventral appendage, which is consistent with clinical, with the existing clinical evidence that uh, thrombosis risk increases and, 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 uh, in these patients and that stroke risk increases in these patients. We're trying to move forward to understand the mechanistic links between the fibrosis and, and these changes. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking the problem and essentially splitting it in different pieces. Uh, right now, one study that I think is particularly interesting that we're doing is we're taking just uh, the booster function of the atrium. So as you know, the atrium has three functions. One of them is just act as a conduit uh, between the lungs and the ventricle. A second uh, function is work a little bit as a reservoir uh, to receive the uh, mechanical energy of the flow from the pulmonary circulation and store it in terms of uh, elastic energy and then give it back to the, to the ventricle. And then an, the, the, another function is to actually actively provide um, uh, mechanical energy uh, by contracting, and that's the booster function. So we're analyzing that. If you're familiar with the, with the flow waves at the, of the mitral valve, that's associated with what we call the A wave the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, those, in those flow profiles. So what we're doing is we're taking um, uh, patients from an ESOS, um, from an ESOS uh, cohort, so those are patients that who have had a stroke, and uh, we don't know the, the origin of, this, of these strokes, and that's why we call them ESOS, but they're, again, they're highly suspected to come from the atrium. And we're also taking a population of patients for, with no atrial fibrillation, uh, some of whom are an, um, undergoing anticoagulation therapy, uh, so um, um, those are that. And then we're considering uh, on, the, on the fibrosis axis, we're actually considering patients with high fibrosis, like the, the first and third example there, and also patients with low fibrosis. And then for each patient, we run four simulations. One with where we essentially turn off the, fibr the effect of fibrosis. So this is essentially going back to looking at how that patient's atrium would behave if they didn't have fibrosis, or at least that's what our model would do. Then we increase the passive stiffness uh, by a factor of five in the fibrotic regions, and that's the only thing that we do. Then we decrease the contractility tension uh, in another set of simulations and then we consider both changes. So fibrotic regions with increased passive stiffness and also decreased active tension. So this is the kind of uh, results that one gets. Um, for instance, for a patient with uh, um, high fibrosis, um, and you can see now the four simulations here, the baseline, the stiffness simulation, and the, oops, let me go back here. There you go. And bo the both uh, stiffness and active tension simulation, and again, anterior, posterior uh, view of the fibrosis. And on the right, you see uh, how the atrial uh, volume changes with time and the appendage volume changes with time in this, in this patient as you vary these this fibrotic e effects. And uh, you, we do see an effect in this case. You see an, a decrease in kinetic energy of the flow as you, as you, um, as you start turning on the different uh, fibrotic effects. To be able to quantify a little bit these changes, what we do is we compute these uh, histograms or probability density functions of the change in kinetic energy. So we take the kinetic energy uh, of, the, of the flow and divide it by the kinetic energy of the baseline, the baseline case where we, where we turn off the effects of fibrosis. And we look at this in spheres uh, close to the wall of the atrium. So uh, we start uh, uh, drawing little spheres uh, around each point in the atrium, and we do that for fibrotic points and for non-fibrotic points. And the goal of that is try to understand if, if these uh, effects are global or local, okay? Um, so what you see here is the, the change in, in kinetic energy for, fibr for near fibrotic uh, pixels in the image for the atrial body and for the appendage, and the same here for uh, on the right uh, for non-fibrotic uh, pixels, okay? And what you can see is that the, the changes are pretty similar. 
these uh, distributions are typically centered around a number that is lower than one, meaning that in, in average or in, in, in mode, there is a decrease in kinetic energy. And then the decrease becomes larger as, as you start turning on, um, uh, as you consider stiffness versus active uh, tension, or if you consider both, okay? So it, in this particular case, you see that active tension uh, is a more important effect than stiffness, which kind of makes sense when you consider the booster uh, function only because there is a stiffness effect because you are contracting, the atrium is contracting against stiffer material when you increase the stiffness, but um, decrease in active tension generation seems to be a more important effect. And as you can see, these two effects are synergistic and they cooperate. So you see the highest decrease, uh, the largest decrease when you turn both the, down the t tension generation or, and you increase the stiffness. And in these cases, you can see actually the decreases are almost by a factor of two. And especially in the appendage, the kinetic energy, you see large, large decreases. And um, again, these decreases tend to be the same uh, or similar uh, near fibrotic points and near non-fibrotic points, pointing to the, or hinting the, to the idea that these changes in the flow are global, okay? That when you have fibrosis, you modify uh, uh, the flow everywhere, not only close to the fibrotic points, okay? Um, this is a case uh, uh, where we did a similar study for low fibrosis, for a, for a patient that had low fibrosis, and in that case, you see that the changes as one would expect are very small, okay? So I'm, I'm not gonna get into, st into the statistics of this one because they're not very exciting. Um, and I'm gonna be closing in a couple minutes. The, the next thing that we've tried to analyze is um, try to make, make a little bit of sense of these, of these changes. So here you see data from uh, four, uh, four patients. Again, um, on the left, high, fibro high fibros fibrosis, on the right, low fibrosis, and then AFib and ESOS, okay? Um, as you can see, for instance, in this particular patient who actually had a stroke uh, because it's an ESOS, but they have very low fibrosis, only a 7%, the circles, there is a very small change in, in kinetic energy of the flow um, when you turn on the effect of fibrosis, pointing to the fact that perhaps this patient actually had a stroke that was non-cardiogenic, okay? Um, and then, if, you know, if you take, for instance, the, I think these squares, which is a patient with high fibrosis component, uh, 40, 47%, you start here in the baseline case and then you decrease your kinetic energy by almost a factor of three uh, in, the, in the atrial body. This is for the atrial body as, as you turn on the effect of fibrosis. And again, um, active tension and stiffness for this particular patient seem to make a similar effect, but then it is when you turn both on that really you see a, a large change. Um, and I want to point the, uh, your uh, attention to something that you probably already noticed, which is that all these points fall, fall on the same line, okay? And they fall on the same line uh, when you actually plot them in a certain manner, uh, which is when you normalize the kinetic energy by, uh, by a couple of magnitudes that make that number non-dimensional, okay? So um, when the kinetic energy there is normalized by the volume to the two-thirds times the heart rate squared, and that's a magnitude that has dimensions of kinetic energy. Uh, so you, here you see a, a non-dimensional uh, kinetic energy variation index, and it's plotted versus the ejection fraction of the atrium. Um, and when you, when you plot the data in that, in that manner, what you see is that the kinetic energy in the flow follows a universal behavior, or mostly, right? They don't exactly fall on the same line, but they fall all very close to, the same, to being on the same line, meaning uh, that the particular anatomy of the atrial body doesn't really play a, an important role in setting how the fibrosis affects the, uh, the, the hemodynamics, uh, or at least all those effects are captured by the, by the function, okay? That, uh, we can get into the details of why that happens, uh, uh, but I think it's mainly due to mass conservation, okay? So the, the, body, the body of the atrium has to take out the amount of fluid that it receives, and it's gonna do that by e either by booster function, reservoir function, or conduit function, or a combination thereof of the three components, and it needs to take the stroke volume out every, every cardiac cycle. And that essentially forces the, the flow, uh, the flow to, uh, to have a certain kinetic energy when you know the volume of the atrium 
and, uh, and you know the heart rate. And uh, this is something that also happens when you start considering effects, for instance, that are uh, like non-Newtonian effects that I think Oscar will talk a little bit uh, about uh, later. Those effects are, are in negligible in the ethereal body because, because mass conservation doesn't imply, uh, doesn't involve any viscosity or any uh, that, um, mechanical property of, of, the, of, the flu of the fluid. And, and in this case, it result is points to something like that. Okay, so the flow in the body of the atrium is essentially fixed by the, by the ejection fraction of the atrium and, and the anatomy in the body doesn't, doesn't really matter that much. I think this is something interesting, uh, something to think about when thinking about occluders, thinking about the effect of occluders, thinking about you know, the effect of um, potential therapies uh, um, in terms of regional versus global function. Now, when we do a similar plot for the appendage, then things change. Uh, we get uh, partially the same results in that, for instance, when you have very little fibrosis, then it doesn't really matter when you turn on, whether you turn on, on or off the fibrosis. Um, this, you could argue this is a chicken wing uh, appendage, or you, know, you can call it however you want. It's a boring, like simple uh, appendage uh, shape. But then you can go to another low, fi low fibrosis case, which has a more you know, windsocky uh, shape. And then the first thing that you see is that the uh, kinetic energy again normalized with uh, the volume of the appendage and the heart rate in this, in this uh, uh, fashion that makes the kinetic energy non-dimensional uh, is actually very low to start with. Okay. So for the same ejection fraction of the appendage, this guy has a, a much lower kinetic energy to start with than for instance this, this other guy. Okay. And it decreases, okay? even if the fibrosis is very low. And then the high fibrosis, fibrosis cases, the two cases, you see that there is a, a considerable decrease in kinetic energy in the, in the appendage as you turn on fibrosis in the atrium, the whole atrium. Um, and to me, the, interesting, the most interesting result in, the, in this type of, um, of analysis is, again, first, that when you look at the, either of the two effects, uh, passive stiffness, or active contractility alone, they seem to be uh, you know, playing a relatively uh, minor comparable uh, effect, and it is when you turn both that you really see a, a decrease, and also that now the data don't fall on the same line. Okay? So when you, do, when you make this type of plot with non-dimensional parameters and they don't fall on the same line, that means that geometry is an important is an important parameter there, which is a parameter that, that, uh, that now uh, play, makes, a, makes a contribution by making these points not, not fall on the same line. They all fall on their own line, but they don't fall all, uh, on a common universal line. And so the conclusion to that, uh, or what this is pointing towards, is that the, um, the effect of fibrosis is, uh, is global, but it's actually um, going to be depending on your particular appendage shape, okay? So there's a, a compounded effect. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, end at that. So I hope I convinced you today that uh, multiphysics, multiscale models can be used to interrogate complex interplays between the tissue uh, electromechanics and the flow. Um, we're uh, starting to uh, scratch the surface of these complex uh, interplays with, uh, with these type of simulations and we're starting to see that uh, the biomechanical effects of fibrosis uh, are important in, in, in um, decreasing the flow uh, kinetic, uh, kinetic energy, so in other words, slowing down the flow in the, in the atrium, and also the, the wall motion, that these effects are global, so they do not co-localize with the, wherever your fibrotic points are. If you modify the fibrosis then, uh, or you, you increase your fibrosis in an atrium, then you're gonna see effects everywhere in the whole atrium. And that the magnitude of the drop is uh, commensurate or proportional in, uh, to the, to the fibrosis burden, uh, but it's actually going to be different whether you're looking at the atrial body where the, where the effect seems to be encoded simply by the effect of the fibrosis on the atrial function itself uh, with, without much uh, um, very large effects of the anatomy, of its patient's anatomy, but in the levitral appendage, um, it seems to be more patient specific and, and more dependent on, on its patient's anatomy. All right, so I, I want to close with that. I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. I just wanted to, uh, to show you this guy's face, who is the, uh, Alex, who did most of the work. 
And uh, I don't think he's joining us today because it's like 1 a.m. in the morning <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in his place right now. Um, and of course, the funding, the funding agencies. Thank you very much. Simona, you can start seeing if things will work. Um, Thank you, Juan Carlos. Any question from the audience, if you are awake? No? I don't know if you're listening. Uh, I hope. Uh, just too much food for thought uh, uh, in these conditions. Um, I mean, I have so many questions. Uh, how do I start? Yeah, yeah, just one. Yeah, but uh, people are ablating. People, uh, clinicians are generating kind of more fibrosis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, um, this is not good. I mean, sort of, we should know, no? Right? That just burning tissue <laughs> shouldn't be good in theory for the left atria, but this is a therapy. So there's. There's going to be an interplay of how much fibrosis you create versus how your uh, fibrosis actually, uh, the, uh, you know, um, uh, eliminates those rotors and those reentries and those uh, uh, electrophysiologic uh, abnormalities that, that impair their, their, their rhythm. But I think it's important to know. You could think about, about using this tool to kind of plan ahead what happens if I, you know, crowd, crowd ablate this patient and I now um, um, change the rhythm, but also create this scar tissue surrounding the ablation. <laughs> so, what this data points towards is that the, the effects are going to be global. You're going to sense the effects in the whole appendix, not only at the ablation site. So you could think of this as a predictive tool. I don't think it's there in terms of computational cost, mm -hmm. right, because these models are expensive, mm -hmm. but in the future, you know, with projected uh, increases in, in computational power, you can think of using this as a predictive tool, mm -hmm. pre-operative or pre-procedure tool. And, and just another thing, I mean, because, this for you, um, I mean, the segmentation of fibrosis uh, in this late gadolinium enhanced mm -hmm. MRI, it's a bit dodgy, huh? I mean, uh, uh, I know the system in Utah, etc. I mean, uh, you change the threshold a bit and boom, you have another kind of fibrosis map. It's not really ro robust, right? I mean, what you see right now with the current resolution in the MRI. So, I mean, how do you think this affects what you are seeing, I mean, well, like, like any like any imaging modality, there's going to be an uncertainty associated to it. Mm -hmm. In the same way that the wall segmentation, I mean, you know this very very well. The wall segmentation of the appendix is is not great, but especially in patients with stasis where the contrast actually is not getting to, you know, to the distal appendage. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so what you can do is you can you know start varying your uh, your thresholds in in get uncertainty quantification of the effects and you know like just like any other like any other imaging parameter that that you're considering right how well do you measure the the pulmonary vein flows with echo doppler you know when you're imaging at an angle or at an angle of 60 degrees you know, it's just, so there's a lot of uncertainties I mean, you know the pulmonary vein flow affects Oscar's going to be talking about how pulmonary vein inflows affect the flow. So there's many uncertainty parameters. And you have data to validate the mechanical um, deformation that you have? We're gathering, as part of an NIH-funded study, now we're gathering uh, not only uh, validation data for the, for the wall contraction, but also electromechanical maps. So in patients that are... Yeah. With with okay. with Carto exactly. So in patients that are undergoing SVT uh, um, procedures, uh, they actually do a a Carto a Carto uh, mapping before the procedure, um, and we're going to be using that for validation. Hopefully, you know, it will look more or less the same, similar. <laughs> but we'll see. Very good, very good. Yeah. Uh, okay, it works. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you, Juan Carlos. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, hopefully, 
it, it would work. Uh, yes. Come here. No, I mean it should work with this, but we put it. Uh, oh, okay. We put it in full screen. Yeah. So thank you very much, Simona, for coming also. Uh, it's a pleasure for me, and thank you, Oscar, and uh, thank you to all of you. Of you. Okay, my name is uh, Simona Celli. And uh, I work, I'm a, an engineer, but uh, I work in an hospital, inside uh, an hospital. The name of my hospital is uh, Heart Hospital. So I have to talk about uh, left atrial and atrial appendages. So <laughs> just to uh, describe uh, this talk, my this talk of, our, uh, of today, uh, I will uh, present uh, the workflow that we have activated uh, uh, in collaboration with the Polytechnic of, of uh, Milano uh, regarding this, uh, this topic. Here, uh, we know that uh, these are the main pillars uh, uh, behind the, this topic. So we have the clinical imaging, we have to perform numerical simulation pre and post procedure, and uh, we have to consider the device uh, deployment. Uh, let's now start with uh, the imaging. I'm sorry, uh, there is some problem with this video, but uh, um, I've tried to reproduce uh, the cinematic uh, contraction uh, reconstructed by the CT before and after the closure uh, of the left atrial. In this case, we can see the, the watchman device with uh, a, a sort of blood sack uh, due to the peri device leakage problem. Uh, in the entire workflow, you have to consider three different stages. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, the main problem is that uh, we have uh, three different time, three different type of image acquisition, uh, pre, peri, and post procedure that are completely different. What does it mean? Okay, the first problem, if we want to combine all these type of images, is that we have to perform a registration. In terms of spatial registration, if we want to combine the CT pre inside the, the cat lab, where com uh, commonly used uh, 2D fluoroscopic uh, images, and uh, uh, this is a spatial registration because, as uh, the colleague uh, described before, in general, the 3D model inside the capital catalab is a static model. So we have to register it spatially. Uh, at the same time, we can also put inside the catalab also the reconstruction, the 3D reconstruction, if we have a 3D ultrasound image acquisition. Uh, obtain with eyes or uh, TE, for example. Uh, but we have an additional problem. It's not only a spatial registration, but we have also a temporal registration. This is due to the CT and the ECO images are acquired at a different uh, uh, frame rate. And in general, the, uh, CT, um, the CT data set is acquired at each 10 or 5% of a cardiac cycle, while the echo are faster. So uh, this time, uh, this temporal registration impose uh, the registration in, uh, um, um, guided by the uh, lower, obviously, uh, tempor uh, image acquisition. Okay, we have, in conclusion, dynamic system. 
So we can analyze the geometry, the functional, the morphological variable, not only in a static frame, but along all the cardiac cycle. Keeping in mind that if we start from different source of images, we obtain different quantities. And this is why uh, in the most uh, advanced uh, clinical center, now the CT is the best choice to, um, to plan the, uh, l l the, the, the procedure. Because the CT obviously has a, a, a higher uh, spatial resolution. Okay. We have four cartoons, but due to the segmentation, we can quantify this, because this is not a rendering, now we have a mathematical model, so we can quantify the motion. Let me see, okay. Here we have four videos for the four uh, characteristic uh, uh, left atrial uh, appendages geometry along the cardiac cycle. For this each block uh, box, I've reported the same uh, um, shape in three different views. To show what? To show that the motion of the appendages is complex in the space. We can see rotation, elongation, but also bending effect, in particular in the tips of the appendages. This is the last. Okay, and we can, um, this video is, uh, um, is the, the plotted the distance at, uh, be between the, the, the CT at a phase with respect to the initial phase, uh, phase zero in, uh, in this case. Okay, as we have said, we have now a 3D model that change during the time. We have a segmentation, we have a mathematical model, so we can quantify all the variables that we want to quantify. For example, here we have to quantify the volume of the left atria, the area of the ostium, the, um, the center line, the length of our uh, shape, uh, as well as the tortuosity. Uh, from these uh, results, uh, we have uh, to put uh, uh, the first we, we have to ask the first question. Okay, when we perform, when we, if we want to perform a numerical simulation in a static a CFD simulation, we have to choose the which at which time of the cardiac cycle. But uh, we can see that uh, the, uh, there is a pointer also. Okay, oh, wow, okay. Uh, we can see that the volume can change significantly. So the, our choice can affect significantly the results of our simulation. Another important information that we can retrieve from the CT, because now we are talking about CT, because this is the best choice for us, is uh, the entire motion, not uh, only of the left atria, but the entire domain of the left, atrial, uh, the left atrial. What does it mean? That This means that we can analyze, the, we can retrieve the boundary information for our simulation. In this case, we can see that during the cardiac cycle, at the minimum of the maximum of the cardiac cycle, the pulmonary vein remains fixed, while we can observe a significant uh, um, mitral uh, uh, motion in terms, in particular, of elongation. Ideally, uh, we know that uh, there is also a torsion motion due to the ventricle action, but uh, it's not easy to cope with the CT images, because it's difficult, it's difficult to maintain the one by one node correspondences, so it's not easy to quantify the exact rotation of the, um, of the, of the point of this entire structure. Uh, well, we have a minimum and maximum value uh, of, the, of the entire volume. We know the mean pressure, internal pressure, so we can estimate an overall stiffness of our structure. 
in this case, since we were, we were interested uh, in, the, um, in the landing zone in the Ostium, pla for the, in the Ostium plane, we, f we focused our calib uh, calibration to cope with, uh, uh, in, in, in the best uh, matter, in the best way, the material properties that in terms of deformation about this uh, uh, region. And this is the, simply the, 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 um, the, 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 the workflow uh, the pipeline uh, adopted. Okay, let's now move to the numerical simulation. We have, we have understand that we can obtain a lot of information from our images, so we can perform numerical simulation bef before and after. I show here a, a, a very quick um, representation of our uh, uh, numerical simulation. Uh, we prefer, oh, sorry, 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 okay, back again, okay. Uh, this is the type of boundary condition that uh, we have choose to adapt. Um, what is the reason? Uh, well, uh, the velocity at the, metro, at the metral valve is uh, a, a value that uh, we can obtain with an eco, uh, with also the analysis of the blood, uh, uh, sorry, of the CT in, uh, from the point of view of the ventricle. So we this is a, a, a variable that we can uh, retrieve from the clinics. In the same terms, uh, we can uh, ideally uh, obtain the, pulmonary the pressure of the pulmonary vein due to, thanks to the catheter uh, during uh, the procedure inside the, the cat lab. Uh, these are the, the quantities that uh, are currently used for our numerical simulation. Uh, since uh, all these quantities are wall share stress based, we developed uh, a routine to uh, optimize, the, uh, in terms of mesh, of discretization of the domain, this type of quantities. Uh, in which sense? Well, uh, we discretize the entire domain, but also add a uh, boundary layer to cope with uh, higher accuracy the, 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 mm, the, the variable at the wall. Uh, at the wall. In this, in, in this uh, slide, uh, we, we are showing uh, CFD uh, for three different patients patient before and after uh, a procedure with the, different, the three different devices. We can see that, uh, obviously, uh, it's another aspect that uh, we didn't mention before, if uh, we have the device, uh, the segmentation process uh, is more complex because the, the, the metal provides noises, so it's not easy to um, Se segment uh, to the, 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 the geometry uh, due to the, the presence of this artifact that are white, so uh, brilliant uh, in, uh, inside the, the, the images. With a very time consuming uh, manual activities, uh, we obtain, thanks to my students, <laughs> master students, uh, we obtain three different uh, geometry. And we can see the, uh, the, the, the shape of the three devices that characterize the, 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 the implant uh, geometry. Okay, we have put, we, have, we, we are investigated the plane that divide, that, that cut uh, the, 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 the domain. And what we can see? We can see the flow that passes through the left atrium when uh, we have the lateral appendages, and uh, how the flow changes due to after the, implant, the implantation. In particular, we can see that in this case for patient number three, there's type of finger, it is a sort of per device leakage. So we can see how the blood uh, go inside this type of sac and reduce significantly, very significantly, his velocity, providing some potential issue in terms of DRT. 
okay, uh, we work in the world of the numerical simulation. Uh, we have a problem, how we can validate our numerical simulation. What is the benchmark? Uh, in terms of uh, HASM requirement, but also VV40. Uh, this activity is not directly at this, at this time focused uh, for the LLA, but uh, we are mitigating from a different uh, European project focused on Aorta. Uh, we have developed uh, in, in my lab a, a pump able to reproduce exactly the flow profile that we want to simulate in terms of both left or right heart, in terms of uh, aorta or coronary, um, uh, or coronary vessel. So we have the capability to reproduce exactly the blood, the, the, the flow profile for our patient. Okay, we have the blood, uh, the, the, the flow profile, we can we, we use 3D printed model inside our mock loop, so we have the geometry. We have the problem of the boundary condition of the outlet, because when we work with our numerical simulation, we impose the pressure or we impose the, uh, we, we, per, we, we combine 3D with 0D, so we inclu include Winkessel uh, 3D element, for example, uh, lamped parameters. So there was the need to reproduce this physical simulation also from the in silico to in vitro point of view. To do, that, to do this, we developed an hybrid chamber that basically it is an RCR system, lamp and parameter, because we are able to, uh, to, to, to reproduce the, the, the pressure by setting the uh, two resistance and one compliance parameter. The same that we have used in numerical simulation. So we are working one by one from numerical and uh, in silico and in vitro point of view. Uh, the idea uh, is to uh, change the 3D printer from, from an aort to a left atrial uh, heart. So we have uh, a left, um, left atrial, left ventricle, and the output of the aorta. So for each output, we will use, the, we will use a um, hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, system to reproduce the same boundary condition that we will use in numerical simulation. Okay, we have uh, the 3D model patient specific with the flow patient specific boundary at the inlet. We are working with the patient specific boundary condition out the outlet. We have to analyze the flow because we have to combine the numerical simulation. We want to validate the numerical simulation. Well, we are, we are working on these activities by using the PIV, particle image velocimetry. The picture reported here is for aneurysm, not yet for uh, the, the left atrial, but uh, the idea is to, work, to move uh, versus this uh, new uh, setup. Okay, numerical simulation, done. Validation, not done, but uh, work in progress. The idea is what happens when we deploy a device? Well, uh, we are, we, have, we, we are not a corporate, so we, have, we, we didn't know the, uh, the geometry, the CAD model of the device, and we didn't know the material properties, but we are engineer. So if you give me a device as a, a device, we are able to perform a reverse engineer process. So we put the uh, device uh, in a micro CT uh, scanner, we reconstruct the entire uh, structure, the, the um, geometry of both uh, devices. We also work with the plugs that are not reported here for, uh, for brevity. And uh, then we obtain our uh, uh, finite element model by including also the material properties of the device. In which manner? Well, character, sorry characterizing the, the device 
uh, with a mechanical test, different type of uh, testing to obtain the curves able to reproduce the real material properties uh, of our device. Uh, this activity has been done for Watchmen, uh, Watchmen and Watchmen Flex. And these are the main uh, uh, curve characteristics of, our, uh, of this material, knitting or material. Okay, geometry. LA material in a simplified manner, but uh, we can extrapolate the LA material. Uh, we know the, the boundary condition. We know the material device. Sorry, this is another. Okay, this is a video that start, start. No, okay, sorry, it doesn't start, but also in this case, uh, there was uh, uh, the deployment. Uh, we, we will see the, the, the deployment. Uh, the next step was to simulate the real catheter because the catheter is characterized by a curved shape because we have to insert the, the delivery system starting from the fossovalis. Okay, in this uh, slide we can see the step of deployment uh, of, uh, for the um, watchman device. Uh, starting from, uh, as mentioned, from the fossa ovalis at a different phase of uh, similar phelps, I, I suppose. But uh, the question was, uh, we have to assess the credibility of our simulation in the same manner as we are working to assess the credibility for CFD. In this field, this, uh, we are working in structural mechanics, we have printed uh, left atrial uh, appendages and we physically performed the deployment of the device uh, in, the, uh, in, 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 in the laboratory setting, but also inside the cat lab. Sorry, also these uh, two uh, were videos, but uh, also for this there are some problems. And uh, the idea is, okay, I perform my physical expansion, I can perform the numerical expansion, how, how does uh, our far, or our, how, how does it, they are able to match? Well, as we can see, I have no time to perform the exact overlap, uh, sorry, but the agreement was very excellent. Considering the material properties, in this case, obviously, of the material uh, uh, used for the, for the printing uh, phase. Okay, now we have our CF, our model. We have our device deployed inside the, the left atrial appendages at the osseum plane. We can calculate some interesting parameters, interesting from the point of view of, of the clinics. In particular, yes, I'm, I, I, fi I finish, I finish, I finish. Uh, the gap, so the, the, the distance between the struct and the, the wall, but also how the device uh, is, pro is protruded inside the left atrium, as well as the wall stress on the wall. That potentially, this is an open question, does it provide uh, some wall injuries? At the end, the question is, uh, what happened if uh, I perform a numerical simulation, uh, computational simulation, flow simulation, sorry, considering the real device? Well, we, had, uh, we have uh, had uh, the, the tissue to our uh, struct, and uh, we, also, these are video, but uh, it seems that uh, the, the problems still remain. Uh, we can see in this uh, area all the recirculation and stagnation zone that we know are to, to be uh, critical and to be prone for the DRT formation in terms also of wall share stress. And the TAVs and ECAP uh, parameters. 
this is my last la slide, because the title was From Clinics to Engineer and Back. And what is the back? Well, we know the Virkov triad. We, we have the, blo the blood, we have the, 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 the phenomenon of the wall injury, and the coagulation problem. From the engineering point of view, we have the numerical simulation that provide, can provide injuries with the wall shear stress, a damage of the cell. We have the structural simulation that can provide information in terms of stress, von Mises stress uh, on the wall. So the, wall, the terms of wall injury. We know the blood stasis uh, because we, we perform numerical simulation for us. This is uh, uh, the, the, the pipeline that uh, with the Polytechnic of Mil um, Milan are uh, working on. Now still remain the problem of the upper hypercoagulability uh, to simulate the clot formation. I finish, so let me thank uh, all the research group from uh, Fondazione Monasterio, in particular the, the two P my PhD student that perform all the analysis, uh, extra effort with respect to their uh, thesis. Professor uh, Dr. Sergio Berti is the head of my cat lab, uh, Dr. Filippo Cademarti is the head of the radiology unit, and all the Politecnico of Milan, Francesca Danielli, Francesca Berti, Professor uh, Giancarlo Penati, and Professor Lorenza Petrini. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Simona. Um, thank you, Simona. It's really impressive. Um, let me see. Uh, Runshin, maybe you can start seeing. Or oh, Jose, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to activate the camera. Sorry. Uh, you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I hope so. Well, uh, uh, first of all, Bert, thank you for your presentation. It's an stunning work. And I wanted to ask you about the. Um, validation, because uh, in our group, we performed a, a validation and we wrote a paper last year. So uh, I am very, very interested in the way you are uh, trying to uh, validate the, the CFD computation. I guess, I don't know if you can uh, tell us about some of the details of this validation you're planning with particle image of the symmetry. Yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Josef, for, uh, for your question. Um, the, the, the validation is uh, uh, for the, this topic is, is an ongoing uh, activities. Mm -hmm. We have uh, um, experience and we are uh, some uh, paper published for the validate and under review, the last one, um, for the validation of the numerical CFD and FSI also for the uh, aortic uh, aneurysm. We have developed uh, in-house a, a mock loop, circulatory mock loop, where we work with a 3D printed model uh, printed if uh, it's rigid or uh, also deformable. Uh, depends what uh, we want to vali val validate. Uh, in order to perform a one by one validation with a numerical simulation. So with our pump, uh, we have developed a specific pump able to reproduce the exact flow that we wanted to use. And also, the, the pump is also able to modify the profile during uh, the, the running. So we can change uh, uh, heart rate, uh, systole, diastole, the ratio, of, uh, whatever you want. And the last uh, main issue was to replicate the how to flow boundary condition. Bec because when we work, for in my experience, for my background, in my lab, we use, in general, well, uh, lumped parameters at our outlet, 3D element of Castle model. So it was necessary to develop a specific tool, physical tool, able to reproduce the Winkessel model. So we have developed this hybrid model where the, uh, the, the, the pressure inside the chamber is regulated by combining the uh, RCR parameter used for the numerical simulation. If you want, I, I, I can share the, 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 the paper to you, so if you are interested uh, sure. in, in more detail. 
Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Short sure question, short sure answer. Uh, Juan Carlos. Hi. We um, are super late. Uh, <laughs> But, I, but it, no, 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 no. But I mean, I'll try. I'll try to be brief. But no, I, but no, no. But I, I think it's important the discussion. So I mean, if we do the discussion now, it's okay. Uh, I mean, and I mean, if in the end Jordi cannot have his PhD, I I'm think sorry. that's. So, uh, I mean, uh, so that sounds like <laughs> a sounds like a very very reasonable compromise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So sorry, Jordi. Go ahead. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, Simon. I, I, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation, especially the part uh, where you're talking about the structural analysis. I think this is very necessary, and, and it's the way you can combine the, um, you know, the watchman device, the occluder, and, and, and the teach. I, this is it's fantastic. I wanted to ask uh, uh, you a question, but actually it's more like a question for the whole community, and I think it's important that. Uh, and I also want to thank Oscar for bringing all, all of us together today. Uh, you were talking about. Um, this uh, relative residence time and ECAP and all, all these parameters, and I think you were talking about that before uh, as well, Oscar. I just wanted to ask, to, to cast a question ab about these parameters, okay? Not, not to you, but to everybody. And I, or at least I wanna suggest that one has to exercise a little bit of caution when using these parameters. Uh, they're uh, dimensionally sound, uh, but they, have de they were derived, if you go back to the papers and, and Underground, they were de derived. Well, the, um, especially the relative residence time is, some, is something that makes sense and was derived for flow. I think it was uh, uh, sinusoidal flow in a in a straight tube. Okay, um, and the ECAP was validated with uh, with cell with endothelial cell experiments. Also, I think it was in a facing backward facing step or very simple flow configuration that doesn't resemble the the flow in the appendage. So. And so especially the, uh, the relative residence time, which is, is a quantity when you look at the formula as a function of the, of the wall shear stress, this is something that is, is something that only really makes sense for a, for a, um, for a straight tube under certain flow conditions. The, the, uh, that equation is going to give you something that has dimensions of time, but you, know, you have the data, compute the, resi the actual residence time, you have it. Uh, and, and, and I mean, we're starting to make this type of comparisons and sometimes you get things that, you know, don't really agree very well with, the, with this formula, which are easier to calculate. So, um, you know, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, um, uh, cast, uh, uh, you know, a suggestion that one sh should be a little bit cautious when using this, this formula, these parameters, okay? And, and Unfortunately, the experiment that one has to do to, valid, to, to truly validate this uh, type of parameters is it's a hard one to do. Uh, I know a group at UC San Diego that is, that is starting to work on something like that for aneurysms. And they're culturing cells on a, on a 3D uh, printed system, and then they're looking at the flow patterns, and they're looking at the, then they harvest the cells, and they look at uh, activation uh, um, maps, uh, uh, and that's the experiment that one would have to do, and that's going to be difficult to do for the atrium. But uh, at least I think it's something that, you know, it needs, the community needs to be aware that these formula uh, are derived for very simple uh, flow settings that do not really match the conditions, in, mm. in, in the, especially in a geometry and in, as variable and as complex as, as the appendage. So sometimes you may get different results just because the formula that you have derived, uh, the, the, the setting, the, the shape of the appendage differ, differs from the, from the ideal tube, straight tube setting in different ways depending on the shape, mm -hmm. not because the flow is actually mm -hmm. different per se. So that's something that is... Mm. is no, very good point, very valid point. Thank you for the short question. Um, <laughs> I don't answer. No, 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 please. Okay. Uh, no, Bye. but we, we, we'll discuss. We'll discuss later. I think it's a super valid point. Uh, Runshin, uh, if you can make it in 10 minutes, we'll be very grateful because we could have a coffee then. Okay, okay. okay. I will be a quick. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, mo morning, everyone. My name is Rin, uh, Fan Runshin, and I'm a first year PhD student supervised by Professor uh, Li Jiu. I would firstly thank you, Professor Oscar Cameron, for this workshop on LA simulation, and I am greatly honored to be here to present our recent work on LA simulation. 
Uh, my, topic my topic today is the stroke risk evaluation for patient with atrial fibrillation insights from left atrial appendage with fluid structure interaction analysis. For the background, uh, uh, studies have revealed that more than 90% of embolic originated from the LAA in AF patient. So we try to clarify the stroke risk from uh, uh, the aspect of LAA. Based on the previous studies, the LAA was classified into four types namely the wine soak, kettles, cauliflower, and the chicken wing. And for the several studies, the chicken wing was considered to be the most popular and the safe uh, LAA shape type. While for the unsafe or the dangerous LAA shape type, uh, the classification based on their shape was considered subjective, encrypted with higher intra-observer difference, and uh, finally led to the several different uh, conclusions. Therefore, the first part of our work is try to transfer in the describing mass from the shape based to the geometry based, uh, which we think uh, um, be more be much more objective. In this regard, our hypothesis, our hypothesis is that the LA and the LA geometry parameters may have great difference for stroke risk evaluation, and then we include thirty nine AF patient in our study. 22 of them were having a stroke of stroke history, and the other 17 patients were AF patients without a stroke history. And the following table illustrated the baseline characters for this, AF, for this AF patient with or without the stroke history. After the modeling of this uh, left atrium and the left atrial appendage, uh, we classified these param uh, geometry parameters into the single ones and the relative ones. The single geometry uh, parameters describe the uh, parameters such as the, air, the LA surface, the LA volume, and some other parameters that can solely depict the LA geometry characters, while the, the other relative geometry parameters were used to describe the relative, uh, relative position in shape uh, uh, between the LA orifice and the other structure in the LA. For example, uh, uh, the, the distance and the included angle between the LAA orifice and the left superior pulmonary vents. In our study, more than 30 geometry parameters have been created for describing the LA and the LAA domain. After the measurement, we compared the above machine geometry parameters between the two groups, and the several geometry parameters were found to have significant difference between the two groups as shown in the table, the geometrical parameters that marked in the red uh, uh, were having significant difference between the stroke and the non-stroke group, such as the LA surface, several parameters related to the LA orifice and LA depths, and the accenture. As you can see, the LA orifice and the LA depths play a relative role in judging the stroke risk for AF patient, and the only one and the included angle between the LA orifice and the left superior pulmonary vein has a significant difference. Apart from the geometry comparison, we also assume that the hemodynamic parameters may be great more sensitive to the stroke risk difference, and then we also perform hemodynamic analysis for these two groups. With the, aim, with the aim at finding hemodynamic difference for judging the stroke risk, we adopted the FSI modeling for a hemodynamic analysis. And the right side shows the details of the FSI analysis. In this setup, the outer words for the, fluid, for the LA fluid, flow, fluid domain was simplified by a five millimeter outer words uh, to from um, offset from the surface of LA interfa interface. We applied the velocity inlet for the four pulmonary vents and the MV annulus was set to be the worst during the systolic phase and uh, to be the pressure outlet during the diastolic phase. In this simulation, the velocity profile was derived from another 10, F 10 AF patient with similar Chava score for the 39 patients, including our group. After a long time calculation, we calculated the velocity profile in the LA orifice and its tip. The blood flow into the LA was defined as filling velocity, and the blood flow out of the LA was defined as, as the empty velocity. 
we can see we can find that no matter for the uh, filling or the uh, emptying velocity at the face or at its tip, the non-stroke groups always have a higher velocity magnitude than the stroke group. After the comparison, we can find that the significant difference was shown in the filling velocity at the orifice and its tip. To better evaluate the stroke risk for, from a more intuitive way, we set some particles injected from the four polymeric veins and the particles that and the particles that flow into the LAA was defined as a particle resistance rate, which we simplified with the, the PRR. And we can see that the result show that more particles was stagnated in the LAA. And uh, this indicated that the particles were prone to stagnate in the LAA, then form the embolic in the LAA, which is more likely to uh, lead to the stroke for AF patient. While for uh, what's more, we also applied the specific transport analysis for modeling two different phases for, uh, for fresh and old blood in the LA fluid domain, which we name, which we name it with the blood renewal rate, uh, simplified with BR. In our, in our intuitive sense, we may think that stroke group may have the low BR, which represents the blood stagnation in the LAA and finally cause the accident of stroke. However, the, uh, the result in our study showed a contrary result. The stroke, the stroke group have a higher BR. In this graph, we form another explanation. The particle resistance in the, the particle resistance rate demonstrates the possibility of some balls formation in the LAA while the BR indicates the possibility of blood flush the embolic in the, uh, out of the LA into the LA domain. The higher BR combined with higher, uh, the higher BR combined with higher PR may indicate the higher possibility of stroke. And uh, uh, in a summary, our study showed that the strong prone LAA has the following characters from the geometry aspect it has a low terosity combined with small orifice, while from the hemodynamic analysis, the stroke group usually have a higher PR combined with uh, BR. While for the terosity, uh, uh, this is aligned with the stroke risk evaluation from the shape classification. As you can see, the chicken wing usually have the uh, higher terosity and uh, which is considered as a safe LA type. So we think uh, is that uh, possible to uh, take the curiosity uh, replay, to replace the evaluation from the uh, shape and eyes. While for the LA orifice, our result demonstrated that the small orifice may lead to the stroke, uh, may lead to the stroke, while the other studies showing that the large or LAA orifice may result in a stroke. This difference may result uh, from uh, the following the different definition from the LA orifice. There are three different ways to, de uh, to define the LA orifice, namely the narrowest portion, which is popular in several studies. And uh, another definition is the section and defined between the left coronary artery, artery and the lateral right radiage of a left superior, left superior pulmonary veins, which is used in our study and the other definition ways is the section at the intersection into the LA and the LAA. So we may think whether there is another necessary to make a standard definition for this orifice in our future relative studies. And uh, while for the uh, last several minutes, I would like to discuss about, discuss about the efficiency of SSI, FSI simulation. Take our study, for example. Our simulation time for one cycle may be more than 80 hours with more than 85 CPU processors. This is quite a long time for simulation. Uh, except for the long time simulation, the, ev the efficiency should also be discussed. As shown in the slide, the large amount of time was consumed by the solid part and the data exchange uh, between the uh, using uh, through the pressure and the displacement. 
Uh, but we only use the simulation data from the fluent or the fluid part. So uh, the computation efficiency is highly reduced by uh, this FSI simulation in the workbench platform. So uh, uh, we, 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 we still want to know, uh, is there any way, uh, uh, another ways to describe the entire LA motion for the fluid domain with using the dynamic mesh to in, in the fluent to improve our simulation efficiency in the future. And uh, uh, that's all f uh, for my present. Uh, thank, you all, uh, thank you all for listening and uh, with great thanks to Oscar Camera. Okay, thank you. No, thank you very much, Grunshin. I mean, uh, it just really, you are really brave to start with fluid structure interactions. We all know how difficult it is. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. Just, it's quite hard. Uh, yeah. it, it's really a problem. And, and some of the points you mentioned, I think they are very, very important. This definition of the ostium, I mean, you, you look at the literature, you see some people say that large ostium is uh, prothrombotic, others say, no, a small ostium is prothrombotic, and say, well, <laughs> what's yeah. going on in here, right? And, yeah. and, and in your paper, you really show that, well, it, it, it can depend a lot uh, if you don't have standards on how to measure the ostium, but not even the yeah. clinicians know. Huh? I mean, because yeah. they use like the anatomical ostium or the functional ostium or whatever ostium. And it's not yeah. obvious. Uh, so a very, very valid point. Go ahead, Jun, please. So now it's okay. Let's... Yes, please. Okay, now I will begin. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yang Jun from University of Shanghai for Science and Technology. And thank you for inviting me to attend this meeting. And the topic of our work name is Numerical Simulation, Numerical Study of the Risk of Thrombosis in the Left Actual Appendage of Chicken Wing Shape in Actual Fibrillation. In fact, this is the first time for our group working with the doctor in the hospital to start the thrombosis in the left actual appendage. Also, this is our first attempt to combine CFD with biomedicals. And our corporate hospital is Xinhua Hospital affiliate to Shanghai Zhao Tong Yu University. And also the Mm, the purist present work is really very, very interesting and helpful for us for the for the study. And first now I will begin to our uh, the, uh, my presentation. As shown in the picture, wait a moment. As shown in the picture, the chicken wing shape left atri atrial appendage is the most common shape. So in our research, we found six volunteers with chicken wing shape, LAA, and also has atrial fibrillation attend our research. And this picture is the 3D model for these six volunteers. And for this six case, case two and case three are cardiomegaly, and also case three have five plumbery wings. The simulation process is shown in the slide. We build the 3D models of the LAA based on the clinic CT. And after meshing, we use the CFX because I find a lot of um, uh, research is used front, but quite the same to slow the flow fuel. And for the simulation, because this is our first try, we use the most simply blood flow assumptions. The red one, the red one in the slide is the is the option we choose. In the in the simulation, the blood was considered to be a single phased on single phased uncompressible non-Newton fluid. And the viscosity model used is Gaiaro Yasuda model. After for the evaluation of the thrombosis risk, we used uh, the relative residence time and blood viscosity and the shear rate. 
for the boundary condition setting is as the picture show. The pulmonary vein inlet was set as pressure inlet and the mitral valve outlet was set as the velocity outlet. The flowway across the mitral valve in the sinus region adopted was based on the international regulations here. This is the health, this is a healthy mitral blood flow. And for simulate the AF, we obtain the, the flow, we obtain the flow rate across the metro wave. Uh, uh, we, we, build, we use to remove the second, use the second actual empty waves to get the AF situation for the boundary condition. For this simulation, we are not considering the mo motion of the actual valve. And uh, for this simulation, we calculate 10 caradise cycles. For each model of the LA, we used five sets of mesh to make the grid independence verification. And in this picture is case six. And we find that when the mesh number is about one million, the average, the average wall shear stress value at the LAA decreased is weekly. So we choose the second mesh for the simulation and then the last five case also the same way. Now this picture is show the results of our simulation. It shows the distribution of the blood flow velocity inside the left atrial at the beginning, beginning, middle, and the end of a cardiac cycle and the T means one cardiac cycle both in the normal sinus region, the health one, and also the AF situation. From this picture, we can see that the flow in the left actual changed significantly with the time, with the time changed. But here, the near the region of LAA, the velocity is quite small, and the RT value of LAA is also very obvious to post in these two conditions. So for the detail of the flow field, we focused on the end of the one cardiac cycle and zooms in the area of LAA. And this is the velocity of this of these six cases. And we find that the velocity here is generally slower than normal during AF and go deeper and go deeper, the go deeper to the left atrial appendage. The velocity is more slower. And we also used the relative residence times to evaluate the thrombus risk. It's quite a, it's a quite a popular standard to evaluate this risk. And uh, these results as the picture show. And uh, we find that most of them show higher, higher RTT values at the, at the end of the LAA. And also is worse on the AF situation. Furthermore, we find that the case with cardi cardiomegaly and with additional pulmonary veins have a higher thrombosis risk because the regions is really very, very, very is big. We also analyzed thrombosis risk both on the blood viscosity and the shell rate in the actors. The results as a slide show and we find we find the quite similar conclusions for LAA. The atrial fibrillation has higher have, have higher some some riskers, and the red one is we think is thrombus formed. For for the defined is when the viscosity is higher than the social or the blood shell rate is lower than this value. 
we think the region is red and uh, the stone bars formed. So we can see the red region here. Also, the case cardiomyelitis and also with additional pulmonary veins have higher thrombosis risks. So, for this pre preliminary simulation work, we get the results is quite constant with the clinic, uh, clinic experiments. The LAA is a high, higher risk region for thrombosis, especially AF. And when the patient's LA became larger, the risk of the thrombosis is increased. Also, we find it's very interesting when the patient have additional pulmonary veins may increase the risk of thrombosis. And we want um, this way we will do the more deeper research, maybe it will be maybe interesting. But in fact, for the climate results, the stone one is case one and the case six. So we have solved the work still a lot of limits and we still have a lot of work to be done. For the patient specific boundary condition and the warm motion of the Left, left actuals and also more clinic data and do some experimental modification. It's really a lot of work need to do. And also thanks Oscar for, for organizing this workshop for Communicate. It's really help for us and for our work. And that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Yun, and welcome to the LAA gang. Um, it's really nice, uh, people just joining this super interesting field. Um, I remember talking with you that your clinical collaborator, uh, not sure if I remember well, but you were saying that uh, yeah. they are doing around 1,000 uh, occluder implantations per year, right? Uh, yeah, uh, because this is the preliminary work now. Because the, now the working, we are we now we are do some. We are, we want got, get some dynamic CT data to consider the mm. motion of the the wall, but uh, because the data is <laughs> processing. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but how uh, long how long it takes for you to run the whole pipeline and the simulation for one case? Uh, for for this uh, for the pre present one. Yes. Oh yeah, it's um, several hours. Mm. So if you fun. if you need to process one thousand cases, what do you think you need to do? No 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is not a. We in fact we are now it's just uh, learning, uh, because <laughs> it's my first time to. Uh, to use CFD combined with the biomechanicals, and we are discussing with the doctors. So maybe <laughs> the design is uh, so maybe the we are always changing. To we want to find some short way mm. to do this research and the work present before me is really very useful for me in sure, fact. Sure. So no, but don't worry. I mean, this is a problem that we all have. Huh? I mean, don't think that it's only your problem. Huh? I mean, it's an issue, but maybe we don't need to really process all cases, only the most difficult ones or the most challenging ones. Any question mm -hmm. from the audience here online to you? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jun. So uh, let's switch to Georgia. Are you okay, around? You. Maybe you can stop sharing the screen, June, and okay, then. Okay, I stop. And Georgia Stern. Yes. Good morning, everybody. I'm starting to share now. Hopefully, you can see. Yeah, just put it in. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> okay. 
Let me just put this down. Brilliant. Go ahead, please, Georgia. So hi, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me here today. It's um, I'm really I'm really glad to to meet you all despite virtually and you know meet all the members of this LAA community. Uh, my name is uh, Georgia Bosi. Um, I work at UCL uh, in London, and uh, I am basically going to. Uh, talk to you about uh, the work I'm doing on the left atrial appendage, both from a statistical shape analysis uh, aspect and free structure interaction. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure it has been said already many times, the main uh, issue with uh, the left atrial appendage is that the clinical classification is uh, um, based on resembles really, um, and it is divided into four shapes, the chicken wing, the cactus, the windsock and the cauliflower. Uh, but uh, obviously this is based on 2D images uh, and the classification is highly dependent on the uh, imaging plane. So for example, here there is overlap in between this uh, chicken wing and windsock that is actually exactly the same uh, appended but seen from different angles and the same happens from the cactus and the cauliflower. So the aim of my work so far uh, has basically two aspects to reclassify the left lateral appendage morphologies by clustering of statistical shapes. So introducing mathematical modeling and trying to have a more objective classification of the um, appendages morphologies. And on the other side, to study the hemodynamics of the LAA with fluid structure interaction simulations to correlate the left lateral appendage geometry and the risk of uh, thromboembolism. I will just give you a very quick overview of whatever um, I do, of course, in collaboration with um, uh, both uh, um, Simona Celi in Massa, uh, that you, you just uh, heard in that, the, her fantastic presentation, um, and also in collaboration with the University of Palermo and especially Gaetano Burieschi's team. So we start from uh, clinical data, uh, CT images mainly, um, I'm sure uh, you all know how uh, reconstruction works, but basically we acquire the uh, CT images. In this case, they are all uh, ECG gated and uh, with uh, commercial software, we just build the 3D uh, geometry of the appendage and the atrium. Uh, the main thing is to then try um, and standardize the LAA extraction procedure. Obviously this is this can be a very good point of discussion for later, because uh, uh, what we have tried to do is try to cut uh, with the plane the LAA from the left atrium with the plane that is perpendicular to the center line of the left atrial appendage and a plane that is passing through the uh, circumflex coronary artery. Obviously, there's a big debate on how to calculate this center line for the left atrial appendage, which is obviously uh, not trivial. But this is, uh, again, this is very important for any simulation or any um, statistical shape analysis we're going to perform because this plane is basically what, what's representing the ostium of the left atrial appendage. Uh, so in this picture, you can see some of the cases that we have uh, reconstructed. Uh, we have control cases, so from patients that didn't have any atrial fibrillation and cases uh, uh, that uh, actually had uh, non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And obviously you can see how uh, variable is the shape of the left atrial appendage. So all the uh, individual ana anatomies are called samples in, uh, during the statistical shape modeling. Uh, and these were combined to create an average morphologies that is here represented in, uh, in yellow and is known as uh, the template. And in this video here, you can see the registration of uh, the template of the left atrial appendage into one of the model, uh, in this case, patient number six, uh, that basically consists in the deformation of the template mesh to minimize the distance from the original shape uh, mesh. And this overall shape is then, um, the template shape is then deformed by modes. Uh, these modes are um, specific quantifiable distortions in particular direct directions or axes. 
And this is done to recreate each sample with the precise mathematical deformation uh, that is output in a matrix of vectors. And these deformations are based on the principal component analysis. So here you can see represented uh, the first two modes in orange uh, that capture in this case 56% uh, of the total variance. And the first two modes here um, represent the main difference in, in the population in, in terms of fold elongation and curvature of the LAA. Then we do what is called uh, uh, hierarchical clustering. So at the top of the slide here, you can see again the LAA template um, for all the clinical cases. And then we have performed the clustering that is um, a method of um, unsupervised machine learning. And here uh, was carried out with, um, with MATLAB programming language. And um, we, we don't really know in, uh, uh, in our population, we don't have any information about grouping uh, uh, structure or information on, of the num on the number of clusters that we want to obtain. So the new classification is unknown. Um, so we decided to go for the bottom-up hierarchical clustering um, just because of that. Uh, and um, the, um, the mode matrix for each LAA sample was, was remodeled into a distance matrix. So different methods, again, were tested. And in the end, the, the complete correlation was, ch was chosen. Um, but again, this is, uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, we, we have the feeling that adding more and more data, uh, we need to refine a little bit uh, this, um, uh, this algorithm. Um, and then again, the hierarchical clustering results have been calculated. And here they are represented in this uh, uh, diagram that is called uh, uh, the dendrogram that is basically like a tree based structure and uh, it can be subdivided in structure just by cutting at the desired uh, level of similarity so in this case i decided to have like four clusters so i've cut it uh, here to have four different clusters and then the template shape for each cluster has been calculated and it it's here represented again in the four classes. And again, the morphological features of the four groups were um, defined, especially looking um, at the neck bending and length or uh, the number and position of the secondary lobes or the location and density of the uh, trabeculations. Um, and we have invented some names, but I'm not sure we will keep them like that. Uh, so the main idea would be then to perform fluid structure interaction simulations on the average shape of each cluster. But so far, what we have done, especially uh, in collaboration with University of Palermo, um, we have done patient specific models uh, with um, fluid structure interaction. And uh, we have described both the normal condition and the atrial fibrillation condition. Uh, the contraction of the wall has been developed with a new method that I'm, um, I'm going to explain now. And also we have considered uh, two different types of uh, atrial fibrillation. One is what is called acute and the second one is what is called chronic. So basically uh, the only difference in between the two is um, that we have taken into account the remodeling of the left atrial appendage that is simply an expansion of the geometry uh, by 150%, because this is what happens, uh, uh, this reported from clinical papers that uh, after having developed the atrial fibrillation, you have um, an enlargement of the anatomy. So uh, basically, uh, the boundary condition that we have imposed uh, uh, in this two-way flux fluid structure interaction um, is a, both a thermal loading and a pressure curve. So the thermal load is applied um, on the wall. We had to define a local reference system for each single element of the structural mesh. Um, and after a lot of tuning um, of the thermal expansion coefficient, uh, we uh, were able to obtain, um, again, what is described in the literature, that is a 60% variation um, of the volume of the left atrial appendage during uh, the cardiac cycle. 
And uh, uh, what is what I think is really nice about this is that we can have exactly what happens uh, um, in nature. So we can have an elongation of the structure of the appendage in this sense, but also a contraction in the um, uh, perpendicular uh, direction, which is basically mimicking what the actual cardiac tissue would do. Uh, and we have applied the pressure curved directly uh, on the fluid um, by taking simply what's described in the Wigger's diagrams, so whatever happens in a physiological condition. But when we were considering uh, um, both acute and chronic atrial fibrillation, we removed um, the bump in the pressure curve that is describing the atrial contraction because this is what happens uh, in uh, atrial fibrillation. And at the same time, we remove the, the thermal load. So the contraction of the, of the muscle is not, um, is not happening anymore. Of course, we have analyzed the results uh, based on uh, the velocities, but in particular, we have calculated what we call the risk map. Uh, so uh, th this means basically calculating uh, the average value of the shear strain rate um, along the entire cardiac cycle to try and evaluate uh, which are the areas of the left atrial appendage, in this case, obviously, uh, that ha have higher risk of uh, um, stagnation and therefore thrombus formation. And uh, we have highlighted in red here the regions at higher risk uh, that have a shear strain rate uh, um, smaller than five. And uh, what we found, it's, it's uh, kind of interesting because it's not really depending on the macrostructure of the left atrial appendage anymore, as has been reported in the literature so far. So the chicken wing um, seems to be actually at higher risk than the cauliflower in this case. And um, the explanation that we, we tried to give is that the presence of lobes of trabeculations and knees, so sudden bending, um, are really relevant morphological features to evaluate the thromboembolic risk. Obviously, this uh, is not sufficient. It's only four cases, so we need to um, study more in depth the presence of uh, these morphological features, but it's, uh, it's a start. So what I wanted to bring uh, into discussion was basically um, how, how can we trust the resolution of CT images? Uh, I know that Simona already talked a lot about this in her presentation. So I was wondering uh, if, um, yeah, we can have a discussion about how we could or we should not incorporate fine details that we could for example, get from micro CT scans um, or from uh, uh, synchrotron images uh, that um, we, we could have. Um, so it's uh, in how, how detailed the, um, the geometry needs to be to have relevant uh, and uh, trustable information. And also, uh, obviously, again, when we have ECG gated CT data set, we have um, the anatomy of the left atrial appendage that is variable uh, along the cardiac cycle. So we have tried to analyze uh, in this data set of patients um, how variable is actually the shape of the left atrial appendage. Uh, and so we have registered all uh, our geometries. We had 10 frames for each single patient and we have registered all of them um, on the cutting plane. We have calculated the Hausdorff distance uh, between beginning of systole and beginning of diastole, and we have calculated uh, uh, the difference. And um, so in red, actually, you can see that is five millimeters uh, distance. I haven't reported the legend, but it's actually five millimeters distance. The average distance is less than 1.7 millimeters. But again, is this relevant for uh, our simulations? Probably it is, even if it's just one millimeter or five in some cases. So we need to have like a standard um, procedure and standard workflow to decide what it's best to adopt. Another issue that I'm finding, especially uh, regarding uh, the statistical shape analysis is registration. So far, uh, what we found that is the best um, the, the best compromise is to use a course registration first 
and uh, we are we're especially using the super four uh, PCS algorithm plus some manual adjustment, unfortunately, still. Uh, and then uh, another uh, fine registration via the uh, ECP registration algorithm, so the iterative closest point. Again, this is uh, this is not um, there's not a standard procedure for doing that yet. So I was wondering if any of you have any insight uh, about it. Uh, and obviously, so, so far, um, fluid structure interaction works with the LAA geometry only. Uh, obviously, it is important to consider the um, left atrium uh, as well, both in the statistical shape analysis and in the FSI. Uh, but then, of course, adding more geometrical parameters and more geometrical variability adds a lot of uh, uncertainties in terms of assumptions and in terms of instability of the flow. Um, so this is surely a direction that we all want to go. It's just um, a lot complicated. So yeah, this, this is my presentation. I just want to thank all of my uh, collaborators, especially Matthew Lee, that is uh, a PhD student working in our group that is working a lot on the uh, shape analysis, uh, and Giulio Musotto, that is uh, the PhD student that is, that is working on the fluid structure interaction, and of course, my, um, my other collaborators and you for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, Simulos, maybe you can start. You will have your computer. You will put it here or what? Yeah. Let's see if it works. You need to connect to the Zoom. Yeah. Mute, mute your computer and pray. Um, Georgia, fascinating word, but please, not yet another classification. Uh, I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Don't do this to us. <laughs> No, but well, the, the idea would be to simplify life, actually. <laughs> I like a lot this kind of unsupervised clustering. I mean, it's really super interesting. Have you done the regression? Like trying to look at the, uh, which parameters you have out of this kind of clusters? Because that would not be- Not yet, not yet, but uh, because I don't feel like we have enough data. So, so far we have analyzed 66 control um, cases and 47 AF cases. So the plan is to have many, many more uh, in the order of hundreds so that we can have like uh, a, a proper uh, statistical uh, analysis on this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, what do you want? <laughs> um, okay, uh, didn't I send it to you? Can someone send it to him, please? Uh, I'm talking something very interesting. Huh? I mean, leave me alone. So, and uh, what I was going to ask, yeah, I mean, we, what, what is this super four PCS algorithm? It's, a, it's an algorithm that has been developed actually by the medical physics departments uh, in, uh, in our university. And uh, it, it seems uh, we have tried so many registration algorithms, and this one seems to work um, very, very nicely for our geometries. It doesn't work, for example, for the aortic arches very much. Um, but is this, I mean, is kind of a non rigid registration? I mean, it's no rigid registration and it's open source. So if you want to try it, you can. Mm. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we, we found that using only the classic let's say the usual uh, iterative closest pointer uh, it's uh, it was, no, no, wasn't that, good that, enough no no obviously not but have you tried the for metrica and all this yes and yes. super no. this super thingy works better i think it works better yeah okay. i think the for metrica it's very good for um, shapes that are a little bit simpler than the left lateral appendage um, but for the left lateral appendage, I mean, obviously, if you register, let's say, all chicken wing appendages, the Formetrica works really, really good. But obviously, you don't want to bias the, the code, right? You want to have like a completely new uh, classification. So sure. that's, that's why. Okay, thank you, Georgia. I need to.
fire, yeah. So one question, in your uh, unsupervised classification of uh, shapes, uh, do any of the shapes uh, agree more with the cases that you have that have uh, atrial fibrillation? So what we have done so far is that we have uh, done the clustering separately for the control cases and for the atrial fibrillation cases. Uh, this is because we have found that, uh, like, just by looking at them, not really like uh, analyzing them with uh, standard methods, but uh, uh, they seem to be very different. I don't know if, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to go back to the slides now, but even if uh, in terms of um, number of lobes and number of trabeculations, the control cases uh, are much more detailed, while atrial fibrillation cases probably due to uh, the remodeling that happens uh, naturally, uh, they are more enlarged and more smoother somehow. Um, the resolution of the CT images is the same, so it, it's not because of that. Uh, so obviously it will be like increasing the number of the cases. It will be very interesting to look at the uh, differences in between the controls and the AF cases. Okay, Barr has restrained himself a lot uh, not to ask things uh, until now, but obviously this means that we'll be more delayed. Thank you, Barr, in advance. No, just really, really short. It's actually talking about this thing that you just said there. Eh? So it seems super, super weird to me that the trabeculations are more detailed than normals versus the others. So is this really exactly the same CT scanner that is being used for this? It's uh, not exactly the same because it comes from different hospitals. So it cannot be exactly I, ah, okay. the same. So sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that it's related to the scanner and the settings of the scanner <laughs> rather than because this is impossible that this can be so different. So. You're just looking at different machines with different resolutions or different contrasts. Yeah, I mean, the so stated resolution different... is the same. So obviously that. Yeah, but even know. Did, did you check that the settings of of the uh, the dose, for example, probably the dose in the in the normals was higher than in the other one. So I mean, it has to be scanner related. It cannot be differently. I don't believe that. Okay, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for for this comment. I I really appreciate it. I will definitely check this. Because, Georgia, in some of the meshes you've shown, there were kind of holes or, or, or things like that. Yeah. Uh, but, but this could be a segmentation uh, artifact, no, also? Uh, well, actually, it seems that uh, the, the, um, the, the muscle, the pectinate muscle that uh, lies inside the left atrial appendage could create mm. this type of, because what we are looking at is a blood pool. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 so yeah, exactly. obviously, if yeah. you have uh, a, a, these pectinate muscles uh, that is basically yeah. composed by um, fibers uh, laying in the middle um, of the left atrial appendage, you could, when you look at the blood pool, you would see a hole, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What uh, is definitely interesting, and even Bard would agree, is the role of these trabeculations on the on the thrombogenic risk i mean we need to look into this right i mean uh, the resolution of the ct is this good enough to study this properly but up to be seen but definitely it's super interesting to have a look and see uh how it can change no the flow and and all this very good georgia thank you very much thank you okay we come back to in-person presentations Esan, please Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, we are from uh, Simula Research Laboratory, Norway, and we are going to talk about the CFD approaches for atrial flow simulation. Uh, I'm Ehsan. I will, fir I will first present, and then my colleagues Sergio and Henry will continue. Uh, as we discussed uh, today, and, and uh, as we have seen um, that Advances in uh, medical images, segmentation techniques, and high performance computing have supported computation, uh, patient specific computational fluid dynamic. And this has allowed the scientific community Put to. Put the micro closer. Yes, like uh, they're singing. Yeah. <laughs> this has allowed the scientific community to identify indices uh, for finding correlation between disease states and abnormal stresses. Among the indices, hemodynamic indices related to the Bolshevist stress are believed to elicit cellular responses. And as uh, 
has been uh, introduced, time average, wall shear stress, oscillatory shear index, relative residence time, and ECAP are well defined and commonly used uh, in the literature. So previous C CFD studies have used these hemodynamic or shear based hemodynamic indices uh, to adequately predict thrombus formation caused by atrial fibrillation. At Okay, but it's a half of the. Now it's brilliant. Okay. Uh, uh, as uh, I said that uh, CFD, previous CFD studies have used uh, shear-based hemodynamic indices in order to uh, adequately predict thrombus formation uh, caused by atrial fibrillation. As we all know in the room, the atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia and uh, leads to the disturbance of the movement of the left atrium and also causes the uh, flow, stag flow stagnation, especially in the left atrium appendage. And these previous studies have uh, reported correlations, uh, uh, correlations of uh, wall responses and hemodynamics in uh, between the AF conditions and between the AF conditions and the healthy ones, such as with or without atrial kick, fibrotic versus non-fibrotic regions, or normal and abnormal velocity profile. However, if we look at the literature, as Oscar mentioned today, there is no agreement uh, both in both methodological approaches and CFT results. And if we order the studies based on the key factors of the numerical approaches, as we can see, there, is be, there will be a huge gap uh, regarding the mesh resolution and temporal resolution have been used in the literature. Uh, the vast majority of the, the vast majority of the study will be located here in the bottom left corner and only few studies uh, will be located on the right, uh, top right corner. So uh, this study, the main goal of this study was to investigate the independent effects of the numerical approaches, a special temporal resolution and order of accuracy on these selected hemodynamic indices. Uh, however, in the interest of time, I will only focus on the combined effects of the numerical approaches and briefly address the mesh resolution effects. So, um, to in order to investigate the, the gap that I showed in the previous slides, we compared what we call normal resolution strategy, which is representative of the vast majority of the literature, against the high resolution strategy in a cohort of 12 cases. In uh, normal resolution strategy, we use a mesh around 1 million uh, tetrahedral elements corresponding to 1 millimeter grid spacing. We use a thousand time a step and we use a normal solver, which I call it here first order accurate solver and I will show later on why. Since uh, many studies have not reported the accuracy of their solvers and they usually employed uh, commercial CFT solver, we just here follow the default setting of ANSI Fluent by using uh, low order schemes for discretization and stabilization uh, terms in governing equations for in, f in the finite element framework. And in high resolution strategy, we used a mesh with 26 million tetrahedral elements, uh, grid spacing around 0 0.4 millimeters, 0 0.3 millimeters, 10,000 time steps, and our 
our second order accurate in space and time centers solver and it's a non-dissipative solver, OASIS, which is an open access solver and it has been developed in our uh, research laboratory, Simula. And it has been verified and validated over the years for many cases, especially vascular models. So first, uh, as I mentioned, we verified the normal solver against the analytical solution. And the verification results for velocity and pressure showed that this normal solver is first order accurate in time and in space. And then we validated against the default setting of ANSYS fluent. And as we can see here, that the similar fluid dynamic behavior were observed for, by running, for the a transient simulation by running a, a simulation for, with a constant velocity of 0 0.3 for two seconds. Qualitative results of uh, high resolution uh, simulation against the normal resolution strategy revealed visually apparent uh, differences in a flow phenotype. Why normal solution strategy pre predict the flow as a laminar, uh, high resolution predicts turbulent like uh, fluid flow. Normal resolution uh, uh, predicts the flow, it's kind of, it's not smooth enough, but a uh, high resolution strategy shows flow uh, variations, flow velocity uh, fluctuations. Note that I here use turbulence in its uh, narrowest definition of chaotic velocity. So turbulence in uh, classical definition re requires more characteristics. Ha anyway, these, uh, the effect of uh, these uh, different uh, flow phenotype is also reflected on instantaneous wall shear stress, while high resolution strategy captures more flow instabilities on the wall compared to the normal solution strategy. And also, time average wall shear stress uh, shows, the, shows the differences clearly. But if we average the wall shear stress both in time and in domain to a single value, we, we, can, we can see the differences or we can compute the differences only 22%, which is in our view is not still reflective of the uh, differences that we can observe in an instantaneous wall shear stress. Now I briefly address the effects of a special resolution uh, on, the, on the hemodynamic indices. We used uh, six different measures for a cohort of 12 cases by using our second order accurate uh, solver. And we started with uh, 10,000 uh, 10, uh, elements for a mesh with a 10,000 element, which corresponds to a grid spacing 2.4 millimeter. And by having that uh, grid sizing, we reached to the 800,000, 6.4. And also we consider the intermediate element meshes, 4,000, 4,000 elements and also 3.0 uh, million elements and 26, up to the 26 million elements to cover uh, a wide range and fill the gap. Here we just, I showed only four of them. We observed that the, another hemodynamic indices such as OSI shows high sensitivity to mesh refinement study. We separate the results for left atrium body and left atrium appendage and uh, even so for some uh, sorry even so for some cases you could reach to the smooth uh, convergence but some uh, there is an impactful variance between the different meshes uh, for the left atrium and body and left atrium appendage to reach the convergence up to six, 60 percent even uh, with the, even up to 60 percent differences even between the two intermediate meshes both in uh, left atrium and left atrium, uh, left atrial appendage, and also 50% differences between the coarse meshes and the finest mesh. This study might seem simple compared to, uh, in relative to the uh, previous studies, which uh, reached to the which to the reach to the uh, levels of a. Uh, uh, which, which is a high level of the simulations. Uh, 
in the investigation of the normal and high resolution strategy, in, uh, in our normal resolution strategy, spatial and temporal resolution may not reflect the variability we can observe in the literature. Many studies report 10 times coarser temporal and spatial resolution. And also, whether our normal solver, as I call that first order accurate solver, is representative of the literature remains unknown because uh, many studies have not reported the numerical accuracy of their solvers. And there is also, there are two main limitations also in this study. Uh, a Newtonian rheology was assumed, which also is consistent with the old, almost all the literature. Only two of the literatures have considered a Newtonian rheology, and also we, uh, uh, a rigid ball was assumed uh, for, uh, for the boundary condition of the left atrium and left atrium appendage. But it's also consistent with the half of the literature, and it could be a justification by the persistent atrial fibrillation. Uh, however, now my colleague Sergio uh, first, and then Henrik will address uh, these two limitations. It's okay. Um, hello, can you hear me? So, as my colleague Isan mentioned, um, assuming a Newtonian rheology uh, to compute the flow is valid in the majority of the cardiovascular system, where share rates are typically high for example, in small veins and arteries. But it is very questionable in a heart where uh, the shape and the volume are very different compared to um, these uh, small veins or arteries. So in the following table, I am showing you that the majority of the previous studies have assumed a Newtonian rheology. However, I found uh, two studies that uh, um, they have assumed a non-Newtonian rheology. So what we have done is to compute the blood flow in a subset of five geometries. And uh, as you can see there, I, I am plotting the share rate for these uh, different uh, left atrium appendage geometries, and the red point indicates that this is the mean value. And as you can see from the, um, this plot, all these values are below 20. And if we take into account that the curve that links the share rate with the apparent viscosity has the following shape, and that we are below 20, so, <laughs> this justify um, the use of a non-Newtonian uh, rheology. And uh, this cycle um, at the top right is repeated. The viscosity is increased, it leads to a sluggish flow, decreasing the velocity, and le it leads to coagulation, increasing the viscosity as well. So what we have done in that case is to use uh, the Karoja Suda model to compute uh, uh, the flow. And uh, these are uh, some results that we have obtained, and uh, these are the four hemodynamic indices that we analyzed. And what we have found is a correlation between the Newtonian and non-Newtonian uh, hemodynamic indices. And uh, this uh, revealed that uh, if we compute the, these hemodynamic indices uh, with the Newtonian assumption, we can pass to the non-Newtonian using this correction. And uh, in the right-hand side, I am showing some uh, qualitative results. So what you can see from there, it's that the flow patterns are quite uh, similar for the Newtonian and non-Newtonian simulation. However, uh, the Newtonian simulation show more red areas, which implies that the velocity magnitude is bigger compared with the non-Newtonian case. However, the story is, it, it is not moving. need to pass this slide. Okay. However, the story, it's a little bit different uh, for the left atrium appendage. So this study revealed that there is no such a correlation uh, in the appendage for the hemodynamic indices. So it justifies as well the use of a non-Newtonian rheology uh, model. And uh, regarding the qualitative results, what you can see from the following uh, animation is that uh, the blood flow it's completely different the blood the blood flow patterns are completely different uh, if we compare Newtonian with non-Newtonian simulations therefore uh, these results have revealed that uh, um, it is necessary to apply a non-Newtonian rheology model uh, specifically especially in the appendage where if we want to compute the stresses at the wall there is at least a factor two for some geometries 
However, my model still has a limitation regarding the boundary conditions, because for these studies, I, I have assumed rigid walls, and that is a topic that my colleague uh, Henrik will talk about now. Thank you. Yeah, so to address the rigid wall assumption, um, we developed, verified, and validated a uh, moving domain CFD solver. It's based on OASIS, which is the solver we've used uh, so far. And this first plot shows verification uh, for velocity and pressure, showing that the moving domain sol um, solver is still second order accurate in both time and space. And for verification, we uh, simulated an um, idealized 3D left ventricle model and compared it with the previous uh, high resolution numerical simulations and uh, experimental data by uh, Vedula et al. Furthermore, as a proof of concept, we continued by simulating a moving left atrial model uh, registered from dynamic CT images and compared this uh, quantitatively and qualitatively with its, uh, against its rigid wall counterpart. So the movie I've shown shows on the left-hand side a, a velocity slice through the moving uh, left atrium model, and on the right-hand side the corresponding oh, volume, sorry, um, volumetric rendering of um, velocity field, also highlighting the low velocity inside the left atrial appendage. Quantitatively, if we focus on the left atrium body, excluding the appendage, uh, uh, there are no, there are negligible differences in the in the hemodynamic indices of interest. Whereas, if we consider the appendage, there are larger differences for all the hemodynamic forces, particularly the relative resonance time and E cap, um, which are commonly used to predict flow stagnation and thrombus formation. So this preliminary study um, may indicate that rigid wall simulations may be overestimating uh, such predictors of thrombus formation. And to sum it up, yes, on. And to conclude briefly, as I showed in the first part of the presentation that Numerical, uh, numerical approaches can have uh, even higher effects than correlations have been found previously in the studies, and therefore our high-resolution simulation results suggest that we need six to 10 million element tetrahedral mesh or 10 to 10, five to 10,000 times the per cardiac cycle, and a second order and a second order accurate solver in time and in space in order to achieve minimal, uh, minimal numerical modeling errors. And as uh, my colleagues showed in their presentation, their slides, we can conclude that even so that we cannot see strong differences between the Newtonian and the Newtonian rheology and rigid and moving boundary condition in left atrium, but there is a difference in left atrium appendage. And Newtonian rheology may underestimate thrombus formation prediction, and rigid wall simulation may overestimate thrombus formation. Uh, so by saying that, these, uh, these works have been part of the Simcardiotis project, Paris project, and personalized F AF which we've been fortunate to be involved in, and we are new in atrial flow simulation, so we want to thank our colleagues at UPF, uh, Oscar, Andy, Jordi, and Carlos for their insights uh, and helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks like it's so cold in Norway that you have a lot of time indoor for doing super brilliant visualizations. There was uh, uh, a question uh, from Alberto. Go ahead, Alberto. Uh, 
Okay, good afternoon. So, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your talk. It was very impressive and fascinating. Um, I have just some curiosity. So, first regarding the first study on the numerical convergence, both in space and time. So, in, the, in those simulations, are you using some turbulence model or if just, let's say, a laminar, a, a laminar solution? You mean about the solver? Yeah. Uh, it's a DNS. It's a DNS 3D model. So. Okay. So the DNS is like your your reference solution, but uh, when you show that you that you are using, let's say, a coarser grid, in that case, you are not using any turbulence model, right? No, it's not any turbulence model. So it's a DNS model. So therefore. Okay. Yeah. But the DNS is only on the fine mesh, I guess. So I was I was wondering if you tried to include a, a turbulence model like an LES to use it on the coarse mesh and to compare that results with the DNS on the fine mesh. Okay, we have not done that, but I don't know, maybe. Uh, but okay. I think if it's a DNS, um, uh, DNS model and uh, also the solver is non-dissipative, so I think it can capture the, the flow uh, velocity fluctuation very well with a sufficient amount of the grid and time space. Okay, so you mean like even if you are, um, say, on a, on a scale bigger than the column group, the column group one? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and then I was like, just a curiosity also in, the, in, in that study. So, um, so how do you choose to, uh, let's say, to refine the mesh in the boundary layer. So let's say from the coarser to the fine mesh, you, you choose a priori the thickness of the boundary layer and you refine it, uh, let's say, adding more layers or not. So how is your, your approach in this sense? Oscar, maybe you can try you can already answer, to put your... We did uh, a sensitivity analysis for boundary layers and also so that's why we consider four boundary layers and we just consider the thickness and we just try to make sure that we have a, enough uh, elements on the formula range okay okay thank you alberto i mean thank i've you. seen during the presentation physical happiness from juan carlos uh, about this non-newtonian uh, importance in the lake just give the micro or he will kill me <laughs> Thank you very much. I think this is, you were mentioned at some point, this is a boring study or simple study. I think it's this, I, I was thrilled. It, it was myself. It was myself. No, that, he was, he was ah, saying okay. it. Okay, okay. But I was thrilled because I, it, I really thank you very much. Very rigorous analysis, very much needed. Uh, so um, I was very, very happy to see that, you know, that these efforts are, are, um, are being undertaken by, by some groups, which are, it's difficult to, like write proposals, you know, for funding agencies saying that you're going to do this kind of thing. Exactly. Because as Oscar was saying before, it's, we're supposed to be doing it anyways. But uh, so thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of little comments. When you report this, uh, I think it's important to report uh, instead of the numerical time iteration numbers, report your CFL number. Yeah. But, but it's, you know why, uh, I'm, I'm sure you know why it's important to report it that way, you know, because it's tied, you know, spatial resolution and temporal resolution are tied. You vary one, you vary the other. Mm -hmm. So when you report it in papers, please, yeah, yeah. I, I would be very interested in looking at those numbers. But I have the numbers now also in mind. So for the high resolution, the simple number would be around 0.25. And for the normal resolution, it's around 0 0.3. So 0.05 is, is excellent. Okay. Um, the other comment is about the non-Newtonian effects. I think one, when, when you describe these simulations, I think Oscar's going to talk a little bit about it in his talk. You have to realize that blood is not only non-Newtonian, it's also tixotropic. So, uh, and we know, I mean, we know, we see, you do the, the echo studies, you see the smoke. So there's no question that, the, that there are um, red blood cell aggregates forming because you see them, that, that they, they become echogenic. So you see them with the, they're there. But it takes some time for the rouleau to form, and the Carroya suda relationship doesn't consider that. It's a, it's a model that's, it comes from the uh, microcirculation where residence times are so long that the blood is supposed to be already in equilibrium, so the tixotropy is ignored. So 
when you use like a royal Suda relationship, I think you're a little bit overestimating the the non-Newtonian uh, effects. And where you're using, when you're using fixed walls, you're in a sense you're also overestimating the non-Newtonian effects because mass conservation doesn't need a, a constitutive relation. It doesn't involve pressure for or forces. And and the, in mass conservation, in, it, it's has a strong component when you when you look at uh, when you think about volume changes, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's something that um, will probably um, diminish a little bit uh, your non-Newtonian effects. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Pass the, the mic to to Simona and Oscar. You you can go already here. Very very quick uh, um, uh, qu question. And first of all, congratulations for the for the. This type of study is very useful for uh, all of us. Um, my question was uh, on the moving boundary. Uh, did you implement your approaches to air meshing at each integration time step, or do you appro work with a, a meshless approach? For moving boundary, yeah. For moving boundary, we start with one uh, mesh, and you immigrate the registration based on. I want to hear you. Yeah, so the, for the moving mesh, um, we have one initial mesh to start with, and then we register the rest of the, the, the medical Im the, the dynamic CT images, producing a displacement field for each vertex on this uh, left atrial model surface. And this creates sort of a map which de uh, describes the displacement. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, how, how can you guarantee that the, 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 the node at the time and the phase one will be the exact position at phase two, for example? Um, yeah, so we do that by spline interpolation between the two points. So it's, of course, an approximation. Say you have 20 frames over one cardiac cycle. And this is then interpolated, spline interpolated, to create a um, continuous function over one cardiac cycle. Okay, thanks. And the, the last class, is, but I don't understand if you remesh the mesh at the, the, the no. No, we move it, yeah. Oh. We move it uh, directly. Mm. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> okay. The people that knows me, uh, they know how uh, stressful I am always with time, and we are really delayed. I mean, uh, we'll see how we manage. Okay, go I'll, ahead. I'll try to... No, it's not your fault. I mean, I you know, haven't I know. even <laughs> been part of the problem. We're, we're going to skip your... Ah, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> okay, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. I forgot. At some point, this is going to no become pressure, stressful huh? for you. Jordi, no pressure at all, huh? <laughs> Everyone presenting brilliant things and uh, no pressure. No pressure at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank Oscar for, for organizing this workshop. I think it's uh, very interesting and it was uh, uh, needed. So I think it, it was a great idea. So, well, the work that I'm going to be presenting today, uh, it's a combination or it's a work that is done in collaboration with several groups. There are three groups in Madrid, uh, or sorry, in Spain, and we used to be all more or less together, but uh, we kind of uh, uh, move around a little bit. Uh, Manuel García Villalba is now in Vienna, and then we also have collaborators at the uh, US, uh, essentially the group of Juan Carlos at Seattle, and uh, his previous group at the uh, UCSD, okay? So this is a... This is a short outline of my talk. I'm going to spend a little, a little bit of time uh, explaining the numerical methods that we, we have for our uh, CFD pipeline. And then I will essentially focus on three results. The first one is uh, flow characterization and stasis in the left atrium and left atrium appendage. Then I will talk a little bit about the uh, effects of uh, non-Newtonian blood rheology. And then finally, the effect of the PV flow split that you will see is the only thing that we cannot essentially personalize uh, to each particular patient, okay? So well, I think I can essentially skip this one, okay? So why we study lef the left atrium? I think we all know what we want to do, okay? <laughs> so the problem from our point of view is a lack of the tools to predict uh, each patient's risk uh, of thrombosis and an incomplete mechanistic understanding of the left atrium uh, thrombosis uh, determinants, okay? And the objectives of 
this talk essentially is to tell you how we are doing the personalized <coughs> risk assessment of the left atrium uh, appendage thrombogenesis and stasis. And the long-term objective is to generate insight uh, to develop risk in, uh, indices that are accessible via uh, imaging, okay? So this is the pipeline that uh, Juan Carlos saw before, okay? Uh, for the simulations that I'm going to be presenting in this uh, simulation, we essentially use uh, CT image data, data as uh, input. And then we go from our segmentation to a Lagrangian mesh generation for uh, each of the frames uh, to then a registration. And the final uh, result is essentially this moving uh, mesh that we have here, okay? Now, the next step is to essentially set uh, the inflow through each of the pulmonary veins. And in principle, we can do, uh, if you consider your uh, atria, right, you have like four or five inputs to your pulmonary veins. You have one outlet, which is your mitral valve. In principle, from Mars conservation of the left ventricle, you can get what is the actual flow that is going out of your uh, mitral valve. Uh, you also have the, your geometry, and you know how it is moving uh, for the atria. And then uh, from the balance of the mass conservation in the atria, in principle, what you can get is the sum of the flow that has to enter through the pulmonary veins in each time step. But now the question is, how do you split it, okay? So our first choice was, okay, let's say half of the flow goes through the left pulmonary veins, half of the flow goes through uh, uh, the right pulmonary veins. But at the end, that is, first of all, it's not really true because the left uh, lung is typically uh, smaller than the right lung. Second, it also can vary from patient to patient. And third, it also varies on the position that you are, okay? So in principle, we end up thinking that we probably need to check all of them. Now, the next part is the uh, CFD solver, okay? Uh, our CFD solver is a developing house. It is a pretty standard uh, CFD solver that uses the immersion boundary method uh, to essentially model the presence of the walls uh, in a Cartesian mesh, okay? Uh, this immersion boundary method results in a forcing term that is over here. And well, if you have questions or uh, curiosities about this, please let me know, I'll be happy to, to explain. The residence time is the variable that we are going to be using to uh, uh, evaluate the stasis. And this is the residence time is what some of you have uh, uh, referred to as the particle residence time. It is actually the residence time that a fluid particle spends in the heart once it, it enters through the pulmonary veins, okay? Which in principle is very different from the residence times based on sear walls or things like that, which is, I mean, if you are considering a tube, right, like what Juan Carlos is saying, they are comparable, but if you are considering a chamber that is essentially squeezing and pumping out an in uh, flow, then these two are going to be very, very different, okay? So essentially our TR represents the time elapsed since uh, the fluid at a given position entering the LA is a measure of how old is the blood in the left atrium, right? Now, there is one parameter here that is kind of hidden, which is blood viscosity, and as the previous uh, talk uh, uh, emphasized, in principle, the behavior of the blood uh, is, uh, it has a complex rheology, right? So it is a shear thinning and a tixotropic uh, fluid. The shear thinning uh, part of the behavior can be captured with the Carrulla Suda model, okay, which is something like this, and in principle, the interesting thing is that uh, the, whether you have something like the red line or the blue line, this is something that depends on the hematocrit of the, of, of the blood. So this is something that you can actually personalize. You could go, take your patient, uh, uh, analyze the blood and get the hematocrit, and based on that, choose one value of the other, okay? The second part is the uh, tixotropic uh, behavior of the, of the blood, and this uh, means that this sheer thinning behavior that the blood has requires some time for these uh, rulers uh, of or, or uh, aggregates of a red cell to form, okay? So we include this in the model by essentially uh, multiplying uh, uh, our non-Newtonian uh, model looks like this. This mu zero is the, let's say, baseline uh, uh, blood viscosity. This delta of mu is the change in the blood viscosity due to the Carrugia Suna model. And this goes multiplied by this function, which is a function of the local residence time of that fluid particle, okay? So only when a fluid particle has been in the heart long enough, and we, based on some uh, analysis, decide that uh, long enough is about the three, uh, 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 three cardiac cycles. Uh, only when it is, uh, has been there for long enough, then you allow the, the, the non-Newtonian uh, behavior to kick in, okay? So, this is uh, how uh, one of our typical simulations look like, okay? Uh, the, mm, 
Uh, we, we use a box that is uh, 13 centimeters uh, big, and we discretize this box with 256 uh, points, and then we put our, um, our uh, left atrium model inside. Uh, this uh, left atrium model is moving, and that is forcing essentially the flow in and out. We help the flow going in and out through the pulmonary veins with, uh, using some buffer uh, regions and some uh, numerical tricks that, again, if you are interested, we are happy to share. There are two things that are important here. We run our simulations for a long time. Okay? We run them for 10 uh, cycles at low resolution and then five additional uh, cycles at uh, 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 nominal resolution. And the thing is that the residence time, especially the residence time in the left atrium, since the blood takes time to get in, it, you, you really need to run for long times in order to have an assessment of the stasis in the left, uh, in the left atrium appendage. Okay? Uh, here is uh, uh, the typical cost of the simulations is about 16,000 uh, of CPU hours. And we run in the small cluster that we have at the UC3M. We essentially run one of these uh, every week. Okay? So they are costly, but in principle, they are, uh, it's something that you can, you can actually do. Okay? And the results that I'm showing here correspond to results for uh, Newton and blood theory. Okay, so the database that we have at the present time is a growing database. Okay, we have a project uh, that is essentially uh, generating new segmentations of uh, left atrium uh, uh, geometries. Uh, right now, we have 15 segmented geometries. Uh, we have 12 simulated, and in principle, we have something like eight cases that have a normal uh, left atrium function with values of volume and ejection fractions that are within normal ranges. Uh, and then we have at least four of them that, are, that have impaired uh, LA function. Okay? Of these, uh, uh, three of them are uh, known cases with uh, thrombus. Okay? So these are our uh, endpoints, are cases that we know that develop thrombus. Okay? For these two cases, this one and this one, uh, at the time of imaging, there was a thrombus in the left atrium appendage. And we removed that thrombus digitally. Okay? So we are doing the simulation of what we think is the left atrial uh, appendage before the thrombus was formed. Okay? Uh, this case over here is a case that didn't have a thrombus, but the patient had a, an history of transient ischemic attacks. Okay? So we know that he's forming thrombus. Okay? So um, as I said, I'm going to essentially present uh, three different results. Okay? Uh, the main one, or the first one, is uh, the visualization or the, 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 the analysis that we did for these uh, flows in the left atrium uh, uh, and the left atrium appendage using Newtonian blood radiology and a flow split that is 50-50. Okay? So half of the flow through the left pulmonary veins, half through the uh, right pulmonary veins. The two cases that you see on the top are cases that are, have a normal function. The two cases that you have below are cases that have impaired uh, LA function. Uh, and then what you can see is that the cases with impaired uh, uh, function, they move less. Well, by the way, the blue, la the blue color is the residence time and the arrows are the velocity. So the two cases that have impaired uh, LA function, they move less, the residence time is higher, uh, especially in the appendage. And the cases that with normal uh, function, you see that they move a lot. The mitral valve plane moves a lot up and down. The pulmonary veins more or less stay uh, on, their, on their place. And at the end, you see differences on the residence times uh, and the stasis in the, in the LAA. So the next thing that we did was to characterize what is the uh, spatially average uh, evolution of the residence time in the left atrium appendage. Uh, the, upper fun the upper plot corresponds to the normal cases. The lower co uh, plot corresponds to the impaired uh, cases. Okay? And you can see that there is actually a difference in the value at which they stabilize. By the way, they stabilize in something that is of the order of 10 uh, cycles. Okay? So it's necessary to run for a, for a long time. There is also more variability in the cases with impaired LA function, okay? And part of this has to do with the fact that in those cases, the uh, LAA is not squeezing. And that essentially makes that the amount of flow that enters uh, in or out of the LAA depends more on the overall circul recirculation of the flow in the LAA. And that is something that varies a little bit from cycle to cycle. When you plot this, uh, you, you take the last two cycles, compute the PDFs, and plot uh, <coughs> 
sorry, plot the violin plots, and you plot them as a function of the ejection fraction. Uh, what you see is that cases with poor ejection fraction, which are typically the ones with impaired LA function, have higher values of the mean value of the residence time and also uh, longer tails uh, into uh, very <coughs> large values of the uh, local residence time. And cases with normal function, they tend to have lower mean values and also uh, narrower uh, tails into very large uh, values of the residence time. Now, the other thing that we try to do uh, is uh, try to uh, look at correlations or look if uh, there was a clear correlation between the shapes and the results that we got in terms of uh, the residence time in the, the, in the left atrium. And I mean, uh, when we did this analysis, we essentially had uh, nine cases and we were not mm, able to establish very clear correlations, okay? Uh, so you have here uh, uh, side by side with uh, each of these cases, whether they are uh, windsock, uh, chicken wing, uh, cactus, and I mean, they are all over the place. So at the end, we feel that we really need more data in order to be able to tell anything about the effect of the shape. Now, <coughs> in, order to <coughs> in order to move from uh, the Newtonian simulations to the non-Newtonian simulations, uh, I wanted to show you uh, uh, two uh, instances uh, of the flow velocities. Uh, uh, one is during the uh, atrial diastole at maximum flow through pulmonary veins, uh, and you see that the left atrium volume is increasing, and so you have a lot of flow coming through the pulmonary veins, and uh, for the normal case, there is a lot of blood flowing into the left atrium uh, appendage, which is increasing its volume. However, in the impaired LA function, there is essentially no flow uh, in the uh, appendage. The same thing happens when in, during the, in the atrial diastole, the atrial systole. Uh, at maximum flow through the mitral valve, and this is during the atrial kick, you see that the left atrium appendage of the normal case is contracting, so it's pumping uh, blood outside of the, of the appendage, and that, not, that doesn't happen for these two cases, okay? So that yields, in the cases with impaired uh, function especially, low velocity, low shear rates, high residence times. So in principle, this allows or this will allow the tictotropic behavior of the blood to kick in and result in differences uh, between the Newtonian and the non-Newtonian cases. And that is what you get here. Uh, the, the upper row corresponds to a normal case. The lower uh, row corresponds to a case with impaired function. This is our reference, is the constant viscosity on, or Newtonian cases. And this plot show the residence time. And then for each of these plots, you have the residence time on the right, and then the mm, uh, actual value of the viscosity, uh, that the, the local viscosity that you have. Okay? And then what you can see is that uh, for the cases that have a normal function, and these are two different values for the matocrit. So in this one, the shear thinning behavior is a bit lower, and in this one, the shear uh, thinning behavior is uh, stronger. And you see that uh, the changes in the actual viscosity only appear in regions that combine low shear rates and high residence time, that is, in the left atrium appendage, and those result in an increase of the residence time that is more apparent, or that is especially apparent, for the case with impaired uh, uh, LA function, okay? Which is essentially this idea that hematocrit can accentuate LA stasis, especially in cases uh, or in patients that have impaired uh, LA function. Now, all of these things, as I told you, in principle, you can personalize, okay? And the objective that we had was to uh, perform patient-specific simulations of the left atrium. But uh, you can personalize anatomy. Uh, with the uh, personalized anatomy, you can get the proper uh, flow through a mitral valve. Uh, you can personalize the matocrit, and with that, you can actually try to personalize the blood rheology. But in principle, uh, personalizing the, the PV flow speed is more difficult. Okay, first of all, it's difficult to measure, and most of all, it varies with the position, varies with the person, probably varies with the activity that you are doing. Okay, so instead of trying to personalize the flow speed, what we are trying to do is to evalu evaluate its effect on the flow patterns uh, in the left atrium and on the residence time in the appendix. Okay, if you wish, see sort of an uh, uncertainty quantification effect. So it's like it's not enough to just run one particular uh, PV or it may not be enough to run one particular PV flow speed for a patient. You have to cover the whole range of PVs that it's going to have during a normal day, right? So these are uh, some uh, movies. Again, the vectors correspond to the velocities, the uh, blue uh, color correspond to the residence time, and it is not terribly clear, but you can see that if you look here and here, 
you can see that there are differences in the flow pattern that you end up having in the uh, atrium, okay? These flow patterns end up uh, producing changes also in the residence time that you have in the vicinity of the uh, left atrium appendage. These uh, changes, again, are more clear for the case with, impaired uh, with an impaired uh, LA function, okay? Where the motion of the wall is smaller and so the effect of what is coming and how it is coming through the pulmonary veins is stronger on the recirculation patterns that you generate, okay? In order to quantify this in terms of the time of the residence time, these two plots show, on the left I'm showing the mean value of the uh, residence time as a function of the flow split uh, uh, for the normal cases. Uh, these are uh, the lines and the, and the different symbols, and the shadow that you see here is essentially the range covered by the data that is plot on the right-hand side pl a plot, which is the same data but for the cases with impaired LA function. And the idea here is to try to see if uh, even if the flow, uh, the, the residence time between patients vary almost as much as the residence time varies for a single patient when you change your uh, flow split, right? So look at this case, for instance, it goes from here to here as you change the flow split, which is a distance, a change in the vertical axis that is comparable to the change that you have from one patient to, a, to, to another patient. If, even if that is the case, uh, that the intrapatient variability is comparable to the interpatient variability, the uh, uh, residence time at the appendage still is able to segregate normal to uh, uh, impair uh, cases in terms of the left atrium function when you consider a range of uh, pulmonary uh, vein flow splits. And with this, I essentially arrive to my conclusions and especially the outlook, okay? So I think that uh, engineering tools and this uh, workshop is showing that engineering tools allow for measuring uh, and simulating intracardia, intracardiac flows, okay? With the necessary spatial and temporal resolution to actually be able to talk about patient-specific simulations. Uh, and from that point of view, blood stasis modeling offers promise to predict the late thrombosis. But we need to go further, okay? And those have the kind of things that we are doing. So the working process that we have is, first of all, increase our database of LA simulations. This will hopefully allow us to answer some of the questions regarding what is the role of the shape of the um, uh, appendage and things like that. Uh, we are also uh, uh, working into include simulations that have left atrium plus the left ventricle, okay, so that the afterload uh, effect is a bit more clear. The effect of the, pulma of the mitral valve in the left atrium, which usually is assumed to be a small, but in principle is something that also needs to be, to be considered. And then we are also trying to move from blood stasis to something that is a little bit closer to thrombogenesis, okay? And we are doing this, this uh, in two different approaches. The first one has to do with the simulation of the uh, coagulation cascade. Uh, the simulation of the coagulation cascade is especially, especially uh, uh, computationally uh, intensive because it requires a huge number of uh, uh, equations, depending on the model that you are using, up to 40 or something like that. Each of these equations with a huge number of constants that in principle you are not going to be able to make patient specific. So to some extent it's kind of crying out loud that you are going to need to perform an uncertainty quantification analysis, okay? So we are working on uh, uh, reduce order models that allow us to reduce the computational burden of these, uh, uh, of these uh, coagulation cascade uh, simulations. And then we are also working on implementing mechanical models for thrombus formation, which it's also uh, something important in terms of whether the, uh, once the thrombus forms or does not form in the, uh, in the LA, it still needs to get out of the uh, appendage break or do not break travel or do not travel, those are the things that uh, we need to uh, address. And then obviously the multiphysics uh, models that uh, Juan Carlos mentioned in, in, in his talk that uh, allow us to kind of bridge uh, the mechanistic uh, links between the flow and the uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. And with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you Hopefully very much, time. Oscar. I mean, th th this is really seminal work. Anyone willing to work on, on this field, they need to look at, uh, at these uh, studies because they are brilliant. I mean, so it, it's just fantastic. Um, we'll try to have the talk of Katerina before going to lunch. So we'll have in 15 minutes, something like that. We, we can discuss later, but just one quick thing. Uh, do you think that going towards immersed boundary methods provides really something important for this application towards other numerical approaches? 
I think the important thing is to do moving walls, okay? Mm. So uh, without moving walls, we are lost. And then the mm. choice of whether you are doing moving walls with a mess that you interpolate uh, every time step, as I understand that you guys are doing, or doing uh, an immersed boundary method, the difference is what is the kind of things that you can look, okay? So immersed boundary methods, they are relatively inexpensive and they are very flexible. Uh, but you are paying a small cost, that is that uh, the, the wall that you have is a wall that is, it does not have a, a, a boundary condition as good as the boundary condition, the noise leap and no penetration boundary condition that you have. So depending on whether you are looking at things that are very wall based or not, then I would go to one uh, method or, or the other. But okay. uh, mm. we really think this, this tool is useful and, mm. and, and allow us to, to, to do this kind of work. Okay. Pass the mic to, to, to Juan Carlos if he wants to go in, but can you unshare your screen and then we'll switch a bit uh, the order because Oleg cannot present after lunch. So sorry, Katerina, but uh, and the others, but I mean, it's important, I think, that Oleg presents the work at KCL. So, so Oleg, I, you can already start sharing your screen. Sure. So I believe one, one very important aspect is the fluid structure interaction, which is uh, a little bit neglected in cardiac flows because it's a field that has been largely dominated by the left ventricle where the yeah. absolute pressure is very large. Mm. And the fluid structure interactions reflect pressure, pressure uh, regional variations on the order of you know, five to, to one to five percent of the absolute pressure. But in the atrium, that's not true anymore, and the right ventricle also not true. And fluid structure interactions are important, and I think the, I think the field also needs to move towards sure. towards that direction. Sure. And I'm very happy to see that there are already ongoing efforts that yeah. are taking that into account. I think that's very important. Sure. Oleg, don't go away. You need to present. My book, uh, can, please, can you help me? Yeah. So, yeah. Can you oh. share your screen? Um, just give me one second. to rejoin um okay um I, I i need to exit and come back so i can share my screen sorry just we are one hungry sec. oleg we are going to kill you i mean All right, guys, C can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. All right, uh, uh, Oscar. Oh, uh, shit. No, uh, sorry. Why not? Oh. No. Okay, go ahead, Oleg. Okay. Oleg, go ahead, please. Yeah, so, uh, Oscar, thank you for organizing. Uh, uh, this is very interesting, and I've never been to a meeting like this. And uh, thanks, everyone, for fantastic talks. Uh, so, uh, as everyone, uh, I will talk about modeling flow in the left atrium, but also how to model other things along with the flow. Um, uh, this is an illustration of the main thing that we do. So this is left uh, atrium uh, with the moving boundary recorded from patients and uh, flow simulated inside. But uh, one thing we model as well is the actual thrombus formation. So rather than trying to figure out where thrombus will be formed, we try to model the actual thrombus. And here, not surprisingly, it's in the appendage where the flow uh, is the slowest. So a bit more details uh, how we get there. Uh, the concept of uh, uh, Virkov's triad uh, was uh, suggested more than 150 years ago. And uh, three components of the triad. Uh, the first is uh, flow. Is flow is uh, static. Then thrombus is likely to form. Uh, but then uh, second important component is uh, a condition that favors uh, coagulation of blood 
and uh, therefore we need to model chemical reactions, the main reaction being uh, thrombin facilitating convergence of fibrogenidin uh, into fibrin, and fibrin, that's what uh, actually forms the clot. And the uh, uh, final component is uh, endothelial injury, which is the initiator of the whole process of thrombus formation. Um, and uh, but at some point, we also will need to account uh, for morphology of the uh, left atrial appendage and uh, for the differences between uh, normal uh, sinus rhythm and AF. And in AF, uh, the blood constituents uh, uh, change quite dramatically, so there is increased concentration of thrombin and fibrogen. Um, and why we are doing uh, all this? Uh, clearly, it's a huge problem. Uh, AF increases stroke risks uh, fivefold, uh, and most of the thrombi are in the appendage. Uh, and uh, clearly, all the factors in the virtue of triad uh, do affect thrombus formation. But unfortunately, current uh, uh, clinical certification of stroke risk is very empirical. If we look at the uh, existing scores, none of them account for flow, none of them account for uh, uh, presence of thrombin or fibrogen uh, or endothelial damage. They just look at how old person is, uh, uh, what pre-existing conditions they have. Uh, so uh, essentially we try to come up with simple score which supplements the existing clinical score. Uh, yeah, and th th that's our uh, main aim uh, to develop a computational workflow uh, to improve uh, stroke risk certification, specifically in AF patients. And the specific objectives is to model three components of the virtue of triad, use CFD for flow, uh, use ECAP, uh, which already was covered today, uh, to quantify endothelial damage, and also use chemical kinetics for thrombus formation. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the end, stratify the risks. Uh, Quick recap of uh, our uh, methods. Uh, uh, we take uh, patient-specific morphology from CINI MRI images. Uh, we have uh, data from uh, 20 plus patients uh, with the uh, moving uh, left atrium. And uh, we can track motion uh, of the wall. Uh, essentially, you only need to segment at the first uh, time frame, and then the algorithm automatically tracks it throughout the cardiac cycle and uh, reconstructs uh, meshes and their change in time. Uh, then uh, at the simulation of the uh, uh, blood flow, uh, we use uh, uh, CHART developed by David Norsleten's group. Uh, it's uh, an ALE solver. Uh, ECAP is calculated using standard methods uh, already reported today. Uh, and finally, uh, the entire simulation is a linked uh, flow plus uh, thrombus, uh, uh, thrombin concentration simulation to uh, see how thrombus actually evolves uh, in the blood flow. Uh, uh, quickly showing off equations, uh, uh, Navia stocks for flow, and then the uh, new uh, element is reaction diffusion convection equations uh, for three key proteins, thrombin, fibrin, and fibrinogen. Uh, they diffuse in space, they also are carried uh, uh, with the flow in space, uh, hence the uh, convection term, and also that they involve the uh, chemical reactions. So to the very right, this is the reaction term, that's how um, they inter interact with uh, each other. And uh, uh, standard ECAP formulation. Uh, so let's consider simulations component by component. Uh, first. Uh, uh, blood stays is uh, AF versus normal uh, sinus rhythm. Uh, we set condition on the mitral valve uh, uh, recorded from Doppler ultrasound uh, as one of the boundaries. And uh, we can see that uh, flow velocities uh, generally are much slower uh, in AF patient, um, and especially in the atrial appendage. So brighter colors are higher velocities. and. Uh, we, we can see that uh, blood hardly moves inside the appendage. Uh, then we measure uh, ECAP also uh, comparing AF patients uh, against uh, patients who are in sinus rhythm. And then uh, 
the highest E cup uh, we use as the most likely location of the thrombus formation. Again, we can see that generally E cup is much higher in AF uh, and also importantly lies deeper in the atrial appendage during the AF. Uh, hypercoagulability, we just look at the concentrations of uh, 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 the proteins, uh, most importantly, uh, fibrinogen. In this case, this is healthy patient. So CINI was recorded from a healthy patient and the whole model was built for healthy patient. Baseline concentration of fibrinogen was taken uh, from blood tests from a patient. And we can see that uh, initial increase of the uh, uh, concentration is quickly dissolved uh, due to the blood flow. Now changing to an AF patient, the uh, baseline concentration of fibrinogen, again, coming from blood test uh, is increased. Uh, movement of the wall uh, is weaker, uh, as we know from the CINI sequence, and therefore the blood flow also is much slower. So combination of these conditions lead to a situation when uh, flow is not strong enough uh, to carry away uh, the excess concentration and thrombus starts growing uh, and uh, uh, over a few cycles uh, pretty much occupies the entire atrial appendage. Uh, and based on these three components of the virtue of triad, uh, we came up with a very simple score. Uh, so in the top uh, row uh, here, uh, uh, this is a representative uh, patient uh, in sinus rhythm, healthy patient in the bottom row, AF patient. Uh, just recapping that uh, in the left atrial appendage, blood flow is much faster uh, in SR and very slow in AF. Uh, e cup is uh, much higher in AF uh, and deeper in the appendage, and uh, concentration of prothrombotic proteins is increased uh, in AF as well. So here is our quantification. Um, uh, we uh, give scores A, B, and C um, for all three components. Uh, for uh, blood stages, velocity over a half meter per second is low risk. Uh, velocity lower than uh, 0 0.2 meters per second uh, is high risk, um, and medium risk uh, quantified as B in the middle. That's first column. Second uh, column, same with ECAP. Uh, we just set thresholds for high and low risk uh, uh, in terms of ECAP, and uh, uh, same with the uh, concentration of uh, fibrinogen. So, very low concentration means low risk, very high concentration means high risk. And the patients that uh, were illustrated in previous slides uh, were quantified. So, clearly, uh, the patient who was in sinus rhythm has very low risk. It's uh, ABA uh, score uh, for, for this patient and for AF it's a uh, uh, CBC score. Uh, so uh, th there is clear margin separating these two, patient, uh, two patients. Uh, just uh, one case study when uh, we had a patient with very low uh, clinical score, clinical score uh, uh, for, for uh, stroke risk for this patient actually was zero, very low risk. But our simulation showed that ECAP uh, uh, quantified in uh, the appendage was uh, uh, significantly higher uh, uh, than uh, the, the standard value. And uh, a detailed simulation showed that if we initiate thrombus from this high ECAP uh, uh, location in the tip of the uh, LAA, uh, then uh, flow uh, is so slow uh, uh, towards the tip, it will not be able uh, to dissolve the thrombus and uh, it, it grows uh, in, in, into a uh, significant size. So uh, this is an example when clinical score doesn't work and our score uh, potentially works. Um, yeah, so uh, just, just quickly uh, recapping uh, that um, we hope that uh, uh, mechanistically uh, describing thrombus formation can improve the clinical score uh, in the patient because current scores uh, don't uh, account for any uh, information uh, of this type. Um, and uh, one thing which was not accounted for in this simulation is shape of left atrial appendage, um, uh, which already was mentioned several times today. Uh, 
the, the thing is that the spatial resolution of uh, CINI MRI is not uh, high enough to resolve uh, a specific shape of the appendage. So what we did, we tried to uh, add appendage uh, reconstructed from CT to our simulations. This is my last slide. Uh, just illustrating the point that shape of the atrial appendage essentially is another uh, uh, important aspect that cannot be disregarded. And we can see that ba based on four different shapes, uh, uh, chicken wing, broccoli, bean stalk, and, uh, uh, and uh, cactus, uh, in some cases, uh, flow uh, corresponding to certain morphology is strong enough uh, to remove uh, thrombus from the appendage and dissolve it. In other cases, uh, it's not strong enough. And all conditions in all the simulations are absolutely identical. And the, the only difference is in the uh, shape. And we can see that shape actually uh, can play a very significant role. Uh, something to uh, consider for the future. Uh, and uh, another uh, suggestion for discussion is that uh, any any simulation of this type should uh, really uh, uh, compare results to actual patient outcomes. So if, if we want to uh, have confidence in these results, we, we need to uh, make sure our predictions are consistent with actual clinical outcomes for these patients. Uh, thank you for listening. That's brilliant, Oleg. Just bringing another dimension with this hypercoagulability model. So, hello, everyone, again. So, we'll continue uh, with Katerina uh, in a joint work with the guys in Valladolid. Thank you very much, Katerina, for being patient with us and wait after lunch to, to give your talk. Thank you. So, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you for the introduction and good morning to everybody. Okay. Um, so, um, sorry. Okay. Uh, I am Katerina Bazzotti. Um, I'm a postdoc at the mathematics area of uh, CISA in Trieste, in Italy. And today I'm going to show you some uh, results of uh, uh, recent, recent research we are doing in collaboration with my colleagues uh, at SISA, Pier Francesco Siena, Michele Girfoglio, Giovanni Stabile, and Gianluigi Rozza, and Asa Sierra Valares from the University of Valladolid. Uh, the, um, the, um, the research we are uh, doing at the moment uh, is uh, the construction of a reduced order model to uh, study, to analyze the, um, the blood flow in the left atrium. Okay, it doesn't change. Okay, it doesn't work. Sorry. Okay, now it works. Okay, so uh, first of all, some motivation. So why it is so important to, uh, to uh, study um, uh, the, uh, the, the flows of the left atrium. Uh, the, the main motivation is uh, the adaptive dilation, which is uh, the most common type of uh, arrhythmia. And uh, it involves uh, the left atrium, in particular uh, the appendage, which is uh, uh, this uh, protruding cavity of uh, the left atrium uh, that is often associated with uh, the blood flow stagnation. And uh, um, it is assumed to lead to uh, thrombi formation. So it is very important uh, to have a very fast and accurate um, tool to simulate uh, the flow in the, the left atrium. As uh, usual, uh, the blood flow is um, modeled via Navier-Stokes equation. So here we have a parameterized time-dependent Navier-Stokes equation. And the, the role of the parameter is uh, fundamental for uh, the reduced order model. So from now on, this uh, uh, equation, the system uh, will be called the full order model. And uh, here, uh, so we have, um, we consider both uh, Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. So the viscosity uh, could be uh, constant in the Newtonian case and not constant uh, in the non-Newtonian case, and in particular, 
we uh, consider the custom model. Okay, instead, the, the parameter uh, C um, represents a physical condition uh, that uh, um, it is, uh, is patient-specific, so a different uh, um, uh, parameter represents a different physical condition. For example, here we have the cardiac output and we have a family of functions. So by varying the value of C, we vary the, um, the function used to, uh, to, the, to model the cardiac output. Moreover, uh, we couple uh, uh, the Navier-Stokes equation with uh, uh, equation for the edge moments, uh, which are studied to, um, to analyze uh, um, the, um, the, the stagnation and the stasis of, uh, of blood. And uh, for the details about uh, this, um, this way of this procedure, uh, this, there is this uh, reference. Okay, now I want to focus more on the, on the reduced order model. So what is uh, uh, the idea? We can solve the problem we have seen before uh, with, uh, for example, with finite volumes. The problem is that uh, um, this is uh, typically uh, very demanding from a computational point of view. So the goal of uh, uh, reduced order model is to uh, reduce the computational cost without losing too much into uh, accuracy. Uh, to define the, uh, the reduced order model, uh, we need uh, a set of physical parameters. So a set of uh, uh, parameters C representing different uh, physical conditions. And uh, in, the Newtonian, in the Newtonian case, uh, the parameter C is uh, uh, one dimensional, so it is uh, only given by uh, the augmentation factor. Uh, uh, so um, uh, it means that uh, we choose uh, one of these uh, functions uh, with uh, the, the physical parameter. In the custom case, instead, uh, we also have the matopoid and the plasma viscosity in order to define the viscosity of uh, for Navistox equation. Moreover, we need uh, the proper orthogonal decomposition and radial disease function interpolation uh, for the uh, reduced order model, but I will not give uh, details about uh, this. Uh, so, um, what is uh, uh, the, the complete algorithm for a reduced order model? And these models are divided into uh, two uh, steps, two phases. The offline phase, which is very expensive, but that uh, should be done only once. And the online phase, that is uh, very fast and uh, gives uh, the um, approximated solution. Uh, during the offline phase, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you have to compute uh, the uh, full order model for uh, each uh, uh, element, uh, for each parameter of the set M we have seen before. And since, uh, since we are considering uh, a time-dependent problem, we also, uh, also the, the time is a parameter. Uh, then uh, you can collect uh, all the solution into a snapshot matrix like this. Uh, which is uh, um, very um, has a, a high dimension, and uh, the um, the number of rows uh, in this case is called NS. Once you have done this step, uh, you compute you start to reduce uh, the um, the complexity of your problem. So by using the proper orthogonal decomposition we compute uh, a reduced basis space of dimension L, which is much smaller than NS. Finally, uh, we estimate uh, the model coefficients. So for example, in this work, uh, we are using uh, radial basis function interpolation. That is a, a standard technique to uh, uh, find uh, the model coefficients. Once you have done this, you can um, you arrive to the online phase, which is very fast because it is defined by a linear combination of coefficients and uh, spaces. So the coefficients depend on the parameter, while the basis is uh, independent of, uh, from them. And uh, OK, so uh, I will show you now some uh, numerical uh, tests. First of all, uh, the, the setting. So we have considered the left atrium 
and uh, we focus on the only appendage. Uh, so the number of cells uh, is uh, more than half million, so it is uh, um, uh, very uh, demanding. And uh, for the Newtonian case, uh, we consider 10 physical parameters. Um, so the, the 10 function we've seen before, uh, while for the custom case, uh, we have uh, uh, 30 physical parameters um, representing also hematocrit and plasma viscosity. In both cases, uh, uh, we um, uh, divide uh, the set of parameters uh, into two. We divide them between training and sets. So we use uh, the, um, the great part of uh, the parameters uh, to train uh, the, the, um, the proper orthogonal decomposition uh, and the uh, computation of model coefficients. Uh, and uh, we remove uh, the, uh, the parameter in the middle for tests. So we um, uh, try to uh, find uh, the solution of a new parameter that is uh, the, the one in the middle, and we compare uh, the uh, approximated solution uh, with the, uh, the truth one. And in the test that follows, uh, I will uh, focus on uh, the moments uh, M1 and M2. So here we have uh, some results. Uh, so for the Newtonian case, uh, we have considered uh, a time interval uh, with uh, 108 uh, uh, steps. The dimension of uh, the training uh, matrix uh, is this. So uh, this is the number of cells. And uh, 1972 instead is uh, the number of parameters uh, uh, times uh, the, um, the number of uh, uh, the time step. Uh, and then we test, uh, we try to reconstruct uh, the whole solution during a whole cycle uh, of um, simulation. Now we can see the uh, reduction because we pass from uh, 972 to 36 basis for M1 and 50 basis for M2. So the, uh, the dimension of the matrix uh, is highly reduced. Moreover, the, computer, the, the time required uh, to simulate uh, uh, the model, for the full order model, uh, for each simulation, uh, we need uh, more or less uh, three hours. While for the uh, reduced order model, uh, we need uh, 70 seconds for the online phase so to perform uh, the proper orthogonal decomposition for the computation of the model coefficients. And then the online phase uh, is uh, less than one second. Here we have uh, the relative error for M1 and M2. So we see that uh, the error is higher here because it is uh, uh, the moment of uh, uh, the opening of uh, the valve. Uh, so it is, um, we, uh, we suspect that uh, uh, this is the reason why it's higher in this uh, moment. And, uh, but it is of the order of uh, 15 per percentage or uh, 20 per percentage. Okay, and here we have instead uh, the custom case. So the results are quite similar. We have a uh, higher dimension because we have uh, a, a greater number of uh, um, parameters, but, but more or less uh, the numbers are the same. So the full order model is similar uh, and uh, the uh, reduced order model requires few seconds, uh, but uh, the, the advantage is uh, clear uh, again. To conclude, I will show you a qualitative comparison between uh, here we have uh, the full order uh, model and here the reduced order model solution. So uh, we see that uh, the solution are quite similar. There are some differences. Uh, I stop it here. Here there are uh, some differences, uh, uh, but at the beginning, uh, uh, the differences are uh, uh, low, less um, clear. And uh, anyway, the, the dynamic uh, is well captured uh, by the full order model, the reduced order model. Okay. Also, okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, uh, this is still a, a work in progress. So we, uh, we are um, now uh, starting to analyze uh, the whole shield stress uh, as a future uh, variable uh, to analyze. 
and uh, we are also uh, trying to consider other uh, techniques for the reconstruction of model coefficients in order to see if we can uh, obtain uh, better results. So this is uh, the list of uh, main references. So the first two are for the full order model, uh, references for the full order model, while uh, the last three are example of uh, the basis for a reduced order model and an example uh, of um, uh, similar um, techniques for uh, cardiovascular problems. So I thank you for the attention. Quite impressive, Caterina, in terms of this order of magnitudes faster. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Thank you, Caterina, for your presentation. Very nice, interesting uh, uh, work. I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't understand uh, what kind, uh, what type of variable uh, did you sh did you show uh, comparing the Newtonian and non-Newtonian? Sorry, uh, okay, this one. Uh, okay. What what is what are you showing here? Okay, here is uh, the moment time one that is uh, okay. the blood age. Okay, okay. And here is for uh, the full order model and the reduced order model on the, the right. Okay. So, okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Because um, I, I, we have work uh, uh, and we're working today, also today, in, uh, with the uh, RBF uh, interpolation solution. And we show that uh, since they are not uh, a physical interpolation, but they are mathematical interpolation, they produce several drawbacks in terms of pressure in particular. Uh, do you have, uh, okay, experience on that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, also for us, uh, pressure uh, um, is a challenge, so uh, we don't think it, it's appropriate for pressure. So we are considering, for example, neural networks uh, or uh, regression, but uh, we, we don't have the results by now. Okay, thank you, thank you, sorry. <laughs> very interesting, Katerina, very interesting. Thank you very much. So, uh, Alberto, maybe you can continue uh, now. You can share your screen. Let's see if okay, it works. Okay, sure. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. By the way, at some point we should uh, analyze why it looks like this field is dominated by the Italians, <laughs> the Spanish, uh, some people in London, but Italians also a lot. <laughs> and Chinese. I mean, <laughs> it's just a matter of four countries, and, and the rest, they don't care about this. Huh? I mean, I don't know why. Alberto, please. OK, thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alberto Zingaro. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting our group to this wonderful workshop. And uh, the topic of this talk is the effects of, uh, of AF on the left atrium <coughs> aerodynamics, of course, by means of uh, CFD simulation. And uh, this is a uh, uh, joint project with uh, Mattia Corti, Luca Reda, and Alfio Corteroni in the context of the iHeart project at uh, Politecnico di Milano in the MOX laboratory of scientific computing. Okay, so I'm not, I don't have to explain how the heart works, of, of course, to this audience. And uh, let's say the most important things here is that uh, during atrial fibrillation, we have that uh, a disordered electrical, uh, electrical signal may cause uh, a wrong mechanical contraction and hence also, let's say, a cascade of uh, adverse events. As, as the fact that we have a, a, a reduced ventricular feeling, an increased atrial volume, but also some, uh, some changes in the, in the atrial structures, and finally also the formation of blood stasis and uh, thrombi. In particular, here we will focus in this last aspect, and so our our focus here, our objective here, is to have a quantitative investigation of the effects that atrial fibrillation has on the left atrium hemodynamics. So let's start by introducing our mathematical model. So in large vessel as well as in the heart chamber, we can consider the blood as an incompressible, viscous, and Newtonian fluid, at least in at least in, in physiological conditions. And, uh, we can, um, and so we can model it by means of the navi of the Navier-Stokes equations, and we re-express them in an arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian framework. So in particular, we assume that we know a particular datum that here I've been calling as GLE, which represents the velocity on the boundary of our computational domain. And then we reconstruct the velocity in the bulk domain by means, for instance, of an harmonic extension problem. In particular, 
in this kind of CO2 simulations, we also want to take into account of the presence of the cardiac valves in the fluid. So here we are not ex ex explicitly solving a fluid structure interaction problem between the valve leaflet and the surrounding blood, but on, on the contrary, we are considering an immersed surface sigma within our computational domain, and we model it by means of this method, which is called the resistive immersed implicit surface method. So within this method, we are basically adding to the momentum balance of the Navistox equation this additional penalty term that penalizes, that penalizes a kinematic condition between the velocity of the fluid and the velocity of, of, of the valve. So we have already applied this computational framework for, let's say, broad range of, of applications, as we can see here, for instance, regarding an electromechanical driven CFD model of the whole left heart, which is also coupled to the surrounding circulation. And of course, in this topic, I will mainly focus on this part. So on the left part, on the left atrium. And let's see, so for this study, what do we have? So uh, we have some patient specific data. Specifically, we are starting from some geometry provided in, in this paper by the group of Caroline Rooney. And uh, uh, so what we have, we have this patient specific MRI derived left atrial geometry, which are scanned at the end of diastole, for which of course we also, we also know the in initial, in initial volume. In particular, we have, uh, we are considering here in this study, three patients, so P1, P2, and P3. And we want to simulate for the first patients, so the physiological condition and the peroxidmal atrial fibrillations, whereas for P2 and P3, the cases of, of persistent atrial, atrial fibrillation. However, in this study, we don't have some knowledge regarding the displacement boundary, but also in terms of the pressure and flow rates that we want to prescribe at the inlet and the outlet sections of our computational domain. And moreover, we also don't have a patient-specific geometry of the mitral valve. So what do we do to fill this gap? So starting from the displacement and in, and in general, the boundary conditions, we're using here a zero-dimensional closed-loop model of the whole circulation, which is basically a set of first-order ODs, which are simulating the uh, pulmonary circulation, the cardiac circulation, and the systemic circulation in a closed-loop fashion. And then we, uh, we feed this uh, zero-D model by means of the initial volume of the, of the left atrium for all the patients. So once we carry out these uh, zero-D simulations, we can, we can get then the transient of the left atrial volume, the pulmonary vein pressure and flow rates, and also the pressure of the left ventricle that we set as boundary conditions at the mitral valve section. So then we can use all, the, all this data as input to our CF, CF, CFD problem. In particular, how do we model now the absence, uh, let's say, the, uh, the atrial fibrillation by means of this approach. So we are basically setting to zero the, act the active atrial elastances of the right atrium and the left atrium. And so by the end, we get this kind of results. So for instance, here, where I'm showing in blue the volume of the, of the left atrium in the physiological condition, so we can see that for the other patients, which are subjected to atrial fibrillation, we can see clearly the absence of uh, the atrial kick here. Okay, so how do we model now the displacement? Uh, so in these two papers, mainly we developed this, uh, let's say, this, uh, uh, these uh, rule-based models in which we basically are considering separation of variables for the displacement on the boundary of the, of the domain. And uh, we, are, we are feeding this uh, scalar function G by means of the volume computed in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the zero-D model. In particular here in this work, we are also adding a correction in order to account for the motion of the uh, auricle. In particular, in the, in the physiological case, we know to be very, very important. And in particular, we tune this displacement by matching some clinical measurements in terms of ejection fraction of the auricle and also of the left atrium. And here on the right, we have an example of our computational domain, which is worked by means of this uh, idealized displacement. Okay, so regarding valves, as I said, we are modeling the mitral valve by means of the RIS method, by means of a prescribed displacement. And we have that the valve can open and close um, by, means, uh, so by looking at the pressure jump between an upstream and a downstream, uh, a downstream control volumes. Okay, so regarding our simulation setup, uh, we are considering, we are carrying out our numerical simulation in LFX, which is a finite element library developed within our group at Politecnico di Milano. So we are using finite elements for both the uh, velocity and pressure and pressure and pressure field. And we stabilize 
this problem by means of the VMS LES method, which is actually acting as a both a stabilization, but also as a larger dissimulation turbulence model. So in this case, we can use this kind of computational, of computational mesh. And by using also the VMS LES method, we are also modeling in some, in some sense possible transition to turbulent effects that in particular in the, in the physiological case may, um, may change also the results of our numerical simulations. Okay, so let's go back Let's go now to the numerical results. So here I'm reporting the velocity magnitude in the four simulated cases for a single representative heartbeat. So here we are considering a phase average velocity. And what we can see is that uh, in general, so in the physiological case, we have that the velocity are, 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 are higher, whereas in the pathological case, we have that in the overall, the whole domain, we have that the velocity are lower and lower. In particular, by plotting the velocity at the metal valve sections during diastole. So, so basically where, uh, when the metal valve is, is open, we can see that we have a complete absence of the after wave. And this, of course, is a, a result of the fact that we are not considering dietal contraction in the pathological case. But also, we can also see a peak amplitude, um, a, a reduction of the peak amplitude in the case of the early wave. Then uh, we tried, in some sense, to understand if our results are reliable or, or not. So unfortunately, we cannot, in this case, carry out a proper validation process since we don't have available some data to compare our results with. So what we do is that we compare our in silico results, so our results from numerical simulations, against some, some clinical measurements coming from literature. And here we are demonstrating that we are able to correctly to correctly compute some uh, indicators, for instance, in terms of the peak velocity in different parts of the computational domain. So also in terms of area indicators, we can also compute the flow stasis, which represents the portion of, uh, of the HRAM in which the velocity magnitude is lower than a given threshold. And as we can see here, as the pathology becomes more advanced, we can see that more and more areas of the left atrium are characterized by very high value of flow stages. And also here, by comparing these results with clinical measurements, we found that there is accordance between in silico and clinical data. Okay, so then uh, by means of CFD simulations, we can also, um, we can also, let's say, have a different perspective, which means that we can also consider a Lagrangian perspective to simulate blood flows. So in this case, uh, we are, um, so once we do our CFD simulation in an Eulerian framework, we can also uh, inject in the pulmonary veins some particles, and we do it in the first heartbeat only. And then we start to count the number of particles we have at the end of each heartbeat. So in particular here, we can see that by looking at this percentage here, that at the end of six simulated heartbeat, we have that in the pathological case, there are still a lot of particles, namely, um, so suggesting possible formation of, of thrombi and in general, the, the, the stagnation of blood flow. We then compute, as Katarina showed before, the mean age of the blood. So in this case, we are stimulating six seconds. So our M1 will go from zero to six. And what we can see is that in general, in the case of, of persistent atrial fibrillation, we have that a lot of regions are characterized by, by high values of the mean age, meaning that the blood remains inside the left atrium for a lot of time. And specifically, we can see, we can appreciate that this value is very high in the appendage of the left atrium, in particular in the case of persistent AF. Finally, we tried to summarize these uh, uh, two approaches, so the Eulerian and the Lagrangian one, by introducing a novel uh, indicator. So why we do this? Because we want to understand which are the regions of the left atrium in which the blood is at the same time old, but also, but also stagnant. So namely, meaning that the blood is characterized by high values of the mean age of the, of the blood, and at the same time also high value of the, of the flow stages. So we introduce this indicator that we call the age stasis, which, is, which goes from zero to one, and it is equal to the product between the flow stasis and the normalized uh, mean age, basically divided by the final time of the simulation. So by means of these indicators, we have that if, if it goes uh, towards zero, we have that we have a low thrombotic risk. On the, other, on the other side, we have a large thrombotic risk when this indicator goes uh, towards one. And what we can see here is, uh, as, already, as already seen, that uh, in the pathological case, we have a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of regions of, of the atrium that are characterized by a large thrombotic risk, in particular in the appendage. So then we said, okay, 
but we just want a, a single indicator in order to, let's say, have a, a very synthetic inf information of the severity of the pathology. And so we propose a normalized edge status volume function, meaning that we are basically computing this uh, a a a AS as the ratio between the portion of the atrium in which the edge status is, uh, um, is greater than a given threshold divided by the overall volume of the whole atrium. And what we found was that, for instance, by considering S theta equal to 0 0.5, we found that in the pathological case, for instance, we have a lot of uh, that the 27% of the atrium is characterized by, uh, let's say, this high thrombotic risk differently from the physiological case. Okay, so to conclude, today we so we introduced this computational framework to simulate, uh, let's say, the hemodynamics of the left atrium in physiological and pathological conditions by using also a zero-dimensional model to uh, prescribe boundary conditions in terms of flow rate pressure and displacement. And we also introduced a novel hemodynamic indicators to, um, say, to better assess the risk of uh, thrombi. Of course, there are a number of limitations here in the study, as for instance, we should consider a more physiological boundary conditions for the metal section motion, but also we think that if we employ some CT-derived geometry, we think that our results may change, especially in terms of, uh, of worship stress. So at the moment, we are also working on the, on the validation of this kind of simulations with 4D flow MRI data, for which of course, we also have the displacement. And also we believe that is important in this case, as we saw this morning, that some more, let's say, physics grounded model in terms of displacement should be adopted in order to properly catch the displacement of the boundary. And in this sense, we recently published, we recently submitted this paper regarding um, the integration of the electric electro mechanofluid activity of, of the heart in a fully coupled framework. So I finished here. This is uh, our recent paper regarding this work, and here are other two references regarding the models we used in this work. So I finish here, and thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Alberto. Yet another dimension adding the mitral valves and, and having really four chamber simulations. What do you think is the effect of adding a realistic or kind of generic but realistic mitral valve in your simulations? So what we found was that uh, it changes a lot the distribution of particles, so if, if, especially when the mitral valve is closing. So if we employ, if, if we consider some uh, physiological times of the, um, in which the valve, uh, the valve closed, we saw also the formation of uh, small vortices let's say, in the upper part of, um, let's say, immediately under uh, the, uh, Im Im immediately up the metal valve, sorry. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, we think that it is adding some, uh, some realism. But in general, uh, I think that adding the metal valve is also an important step to, uh, to consider the whole left heart in this kind of simulation. So in that case, of course, you really need the metal valve. And we think that the results also for this, like also for instance, in terms of residence time may also, may also change. So on that direction, you think adding uh, the left ventricle, I mean, fully, uh, do you think this is quite important? Well, um, I think that especially for the first part of uh, diastole, so mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, I mean, uh, we are, let's say, uh, surrogating in some sense uh, its, its presence by using uh, the pressure of the left ventricle that we prescribe on that, on that section. But I think that if we also consider a 3D representation of the left ventricle, we can clearly see when the, the ventricle is, uh, is dilatating that the blood is clearly sucked uh, during diastole. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank so you. I'm going to try uh, to play the video of the contribution of MIT. Um, so I guess I need to uh, share the screen. So my oh, name is wait, Keegan wait, 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 and wait, I'm... Wait, 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 wait. Okay, uh, so... So 
Is the people online watching? Uh, I'm a Mac guy, not uh, these things. Yeah. So the people from uh, online can see the video? Yes, we can, Oscar. And let's see, can you hear it? So my name is Keegan and I'm a graduate yes. student at Working. MIT in Professor Ellen Roach's lab. And today I will be presenting on behalf of the entire group at MIT. And I'll be sharing the audio is choppy, um, two Oscar. posters. Uh, and this work was led by myself and by postdoc in the lab, um, Manisha. I think so it's going the through first the microphone work in the um, is entitled a benchtop circulatory flow loop of the left atrium that can achieve tunable clinically relevant pressure and flow waveforms. So patient specific 3D printed models of the LAA uh, are currently being used to improve precision in occlusion device sizing and placement. While these models have led to improved clinical outcomes, we think they fail to emulate the dynamic physical and physiological principles that uh, govern underlying cardiac function and subsequently affect intracardiac device performance and outcomes. So we believe that there is a need for high fidelity dynamic benchtop models that also incorporate the vast heterogeneity uh, of the left atrial appendage geometry and anatomy or even allow for patient specific testing. Um, and through these models, uh, we can perform better procedural planning um, and even novel device testing and deployment. And overall, we think these models will be more accurate, more physiologically relevant and allow for testing in a more diverse patient population. So specifically in this work, we present a benchtop circulatory flow loop of the left atrium that can achieve tunable, clinically relevant pressure and flow waveforms. So the flow loop consists of a custom rigid model of the left atrium that allows for attachment of soft compliant silicone um, patient specific appendages in a wide range of ostium sizes. The model is then connected to a pulsatile pump with a mechanical um, valve in the mitral position, along with uh, resistance and compliance elements that can be tuned to mimic the hemodynamics of the pulmonary and systemic vasculature. Uh, it, as you can see in the video, we demonstrate um, passive contraction of this soft compliant appendage. Um, which can then, again, we can incorporate multiple appendages onto our underlying left atrial anatomy. Um, and then also, as you can see in the video, we can then deploy, uh, repeatedly deploy occlusion devices into our model. Um, then we demonstrate that we can uh, achieve physiological pressure and flow waveforms. Uh, we can even tune these waveforms to achieve desired pathophysiology by varying the pulse rate, stroke volume, resistance, and compliance of the overall circuit. And then finally, we can interrogate how pressure and flow change uh, before and after device deployment into our model. Um, and I can show some example data from that um, in a moment. So overall, we believe that our model can be used for more robust, uh, physiologically relevant, and clinically relevant um, physician training, procedural planning, and then novel device testing and validation. So to look at some of the data we've been able to achieve, on the left, you can see an example of the pressure waveforms um, at the four pulmonary vein inlets. In the middle, you can see pressure measured in the left atrium and after the mitral valve. We do recognize that our post mitral valve pressure is elevated or above physiologically relevant LV pressures. However, our primary goal is to replicate LA pressure and flow waveforms. Um, and here we show that our LA pressure is within physiological range uh, and we see appropriate opening and closing of the mitral valve with the atrium uh, functioning as either a conduit when the mitral valve is open or a reservoir when the mitral valve is closed. 
The next step, which we're really excited about, is to add um, soft robotic actuators around the appendage to make it actively contractile in order to replicate the A wave when the atrium is functioning as a pump and we hope to be able to achieve um, the atrial kick. Then finally on the right, we show um, flow through PV1 as an example uh, with and without a before and after device placement. And here we demonstrate how we can use this model to investigate how flow or how pressure change before and after device deployment, which allows us to explore potential conditions that may increase the likelihood of device related thrombus or even device embolization. Um, so now I'll present our next work, uh, which was led by Manisha, and this work is titled An In Vitro Model with Particle Tracking Velocimetry that Enables Visualization of Left Atrial Hemodynamics Post Left Atrial Appendage Occlusion. So the goal of this work was to develop a patient-specific benchtop set uh, setup to improve our understanding of post-procedural outcomes of LAA closure uh, through particle tracking. So by combining a pulsatile um, model or benchtop model of the left atrium with particle tracking, we can see detailed velocity fields and regional flow fields uh, and potentially regional flow stasis, uh, which may suggest regions where thrombus is more likely to form and occur. So uh, in this work, we created a simplified left uh, atrium, um, uh, left atrial chamber based on the average volume um, of a left atrium uh, of a patient with atrial fibrillation. We can then incorporate our custom um, patient specific appendages uh, that are made of a soft material. They're made of silicone um, as previously described. Uh, we can then deploy devices into these patient-specific appendages. We then um, attach this uh, chamber setup to a pulsatile pump. And here we show data that was collected at 75 beats per minute with a cardiac output of three, liter, uh, three liters per minute. We explored three different conditions in this work. Uh, the first was where we just have flow without a device placed. The second is where we have a device placed and we've occluded the appendage and here we're calling it device well placed where the device is flush or even with the ostium opening. And then third, we have a device misplaced condition where we have the device uh, protruding um, into uh, it actually into the atrium. So overall, um, our data demonstrate that our setup allows for visualization of um, our seeded fluorescent particles, uh, and, it, and um, the setup enables flow and velocity vector tracking uh, through post-processing of the imaging data that we've collected. Uh, the flow patterns then allow for high-level quantification of uh, Peri LAA and Peri device flow uh, pre and post occlusion. So um, here um, I'll just provide an example again of some of the data we've been able to collect. So here you can look at the velocity vector fields of these three conditions. Again, no device, device well placed where it's flush and device misplaced where it's protruding or sticking out into the appendage. Um, we think. Um, that more uh, sort of analysis and exploration of these conditions is warranted. So we don't want to draw um, any sort of specific conclusions from this specific data, but here we're just showing the capabilities of our model and the insights that we're able to achieve with the model. Um, and future work may explore sort of different placement of our inflow and outflow from the chamber to make it more physiologically relevant and to potentially move to a more sophisticated um, left atrial geometry uh, beyond just um, this box and to move to a more relevant sort of atrial geometry or atrial anatomy. Um, so that concludes the, the work um, that we wanted to present from MIT today. Um, but I think um, most importantly, I want to congratulate Jordi for 
this huge milestone um, for defending your PhD today. Uh, it's an amazing, fantastic achievement um, and um, so inspired by your work. Um, uh, so I met Jordi at a conference about a year ago, um, and that's when we started this collaboration. Um, he's since come to MIT and worked with us on these benchtop models in the lab. We actually got him away from the computer and into the lab, although he did try to bring food and drink into the, uh, into the lab space. We scolded him for that, but um, he was amazing working with the model. Um, we called it going to the water park because for those of you that work with um, fluids and these benchtop models, there's always a leak. There's always water going somewhere. Um, we joke that we're really just glorified um, plumbers, but uh, we had an amazing experience. This collaboration has been so fr uh, fruitful and we look forward to continuing our work together. And I'm really excited to see all that you go on to do and achieve. Um, and I know it will be amazing, wonderful things. Um, and specifically, um, as you can see in these photos, um, I'm really proud that Carlos is now an, an FC Barcelona supporter. Um, so thank you to everyone who's attended um, and we'd love any feedback um, on our work. Thanks. Just clap, clap, guys. So that's brilliant. I'm really sorry for the audience that the audio maybe wasn't great. Manisha is around. So um, if you want to ask any questions, anyone has any questions for Manisha? Manisha, you are around, right? Um, yes, I am. OK, good, good, nice, nice, nice. Um, just at least from my side, um, how important do you think that is to include and how difficult more realistic parts like in the left atria and the pulmonary veins and, and even as we have seen just before, it looks like at least in silico adding the mitral valve, it has an impact. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Oscar. It's pretty important. And then that's the next step for us because the rectangular stiff chamber doesn't, it, it gives us enough information and evidence to start with, but ultimately the reasons of flow status and in what direction the, the fluid is coming in, the blood is entering into the left atrium, it will be pretty important. Um, and then that's the, that's the next step for us. We'll find out Mm, how it goes with the flow loop and physical models. Thank you very much, Manisha. Any mm -hmm. other questions? No, there has been there. Okay, but thank you very much, Manisha. Let's see. I think um, it's fantastic that we convinced some clinicians like Abdel to start at the very beginning and to have Xavier Freysha uh, with us to conclude. Um, I don't know why he's listen to us so many times and have been so patient with us, but it was thanks to him and David Artamendi that we've known a bit about the, um, the left actual. Okay, so now everybody can hear me and everybody can see me, no? <laughs> That's good. So thanks for the invitation, actually, like it's... it's the what now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to <laughs> let me start, you know, with a... <laughs> okay, basically, this was not intended to be anything motivational, but um, actually one of my main objectives of this um, talk or lecture, it's just to let you know that um, this has really a, a, a real and an actual, you know, um, clinical impact. That it's just not matter because I, I was listening and I don't understand anything, but it's not just a matter of numbers, you know, like equations and, you know, like colors and stuff. It's also about, you know, like persons, people and, and, and patients. So um, I was just, I'm gonna talk about, you know, like how we have integrated what we have seen in patients, we, what you, in a sense, have done, and, you know, like, uh, my vision about, you know, like, the, the future. So this is like a, 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 a talk that I just did recently in an LA summit with proctors, so with people that actually 
know a lot about the, the field, and I didn't change too much. And I did that on purpose because I just want you know to to share all this clinical you know like um, um, data and and to 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 let you know that what you're really doing I, for for me it's like important. So um, let me start with a with a patient that we did you know probably at the you know maybe it was like 2014. In, in our early experience, you know, like with, um, in, you can see here the mitral, the left atrium, ventricle, and the appendage. This was, you know, probably in within the first 20 cases that we did. We just like measure with 2D in that time, you know, no angiotac, no, no, no CT, no um, 3D echo. So it was like all about 2D. And in this case, um, the, the other thing that was like really common, you know, in, in those days, was just to make sure that there was no complications. And you know, most of the times, you um, went really deep inside the appendage to make sure that the, the device was not, um, well, was not like um, popping out or um, um, embolized. So, you know, like this was one of the, of the patients. And here you can see that the mitral, you know, like the, the actually, you know, the, the device is very stable, but you can see the pulmonary ridge and you that area, that triangle that, you know, like most of you, you already know. So after three months, you know, like we could detect, you know, like the first um, device-related thrombosis over the device in that area, in that, you know, like end triangle area. We gave like a um, anticoagulation, a pixaban for, you know, a while, and we treated it, but then, you know, after stopping, you know, um, you know the, the device, you know, um, or just the thrombus came again, you know, with um, aspirin, you know, like those patients, you know, like they cannot take, you know, anticoagulation for a long time. So, you know, that's why we were stopping a that for the, for the ones that you, you don't know, it's a, it's a novel anticoagulant. And then we gave aspirin back and then the thrombus came back. So we gave again a pixaban for three months and the thrombus came back. And then we gave again, you know, like aspirin. And, you know, like um, after, you know, like three months of um, a pixaban, you know, at the end, you know, like just the thrombus in a sense disappear, but it remained, you know, like a, like an image, you know, like a strange image that, you know, like after we made a CT scan and you can see here that, you know, that area of uh, that triangular area um, was covered by, you know, like endothelization and thrombus. In a sense, the body, you know, or, you know, like just the, 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 the platelets create, you know, like a thrombus with a round shape to cover that pulmonary ridge that we that we missed. So that's probably one of the first cases that, you know, in a sense we studied um, in order to, you know, just to, to evaluate all this all this stuff about like flow dynamics in, in, in this field. And actually, you know, like DRT that for you it's maybe a name, um, it's something, you know, like clinically re relevant for patients. It's just not, you know, like thrombosis, something that you, you need to avoid. It's real, you know. Um, this is like the rates of device-related thrombosis over, you know, different devices and different registries. You know, a rate up to 16. Uh, but I would say that, you know, like the real, the actual rate of device-related thrombosis ranges between 3, 4, and 6, 7, 8 percent, you know, because um, you know, like now we know that we have to do more tests, you know, just to follow the patients. So, you know, the real, the real rate probably it's around 7%. And, you know, from, you know, recent data, not so recent, but, you know, like relatively recent data, we know that this has also a, uh, an impact. If you have like a thrombus over the device, you're going to have like more chances to have like a stroke. So this is something, again, that we really need to avoid. And any tool, you know, in that sense, you know, it's going to help. So apart, you know, from the case that, you know, I already show, like other publications also suggested that the fact of not covering this ridge, you know, and was related, as you can see here, with thrombus, with a higher risk of thrombus. This, you know, like a first publication in CCI, then a second publication in JAC-CI, where you can see that the thrombus, you know, it's again, you know, here, you know, at the level of this pulmonary ridge. And this publication made for us where we can see or we, we could see that um, um, out of 11 patients with thrombosis, 10 of them presented in like this pulmonary rich and cover. You can see not cover, not cover, not cover, not cover. And the only one that was covered was this one that had like a very, very, very small DRT. So this was something that was um, relevant. 
there are also other, other, other factors, no? other predictors of the virus-related thrombosis. But as you can see here, most of them are not modifiable. So um, what you're doing in a sense, it's you know, like giving us you know, uh, uh, like the evidence to make some changes um, in, the, in the intervention to reduce something that otherwise, you know, like um, renal insufficiency, how you change that, you cannot change. Non-paroxysmal AF, you cannot change that. Like other factors that at the end you cannot change. So this is probably one of the only, or the, the, maybe there are some, some other, but you know, one of the main um, factors that can, be, that can be, you know, changed when we are doing an implantation. So here, you know, like, are also, you know, like different, you know, like analysis, but I'm not gonna stop here. And actually, that was the theory, you know, um, with the, that was like, um, in a sense, um, in the, in the Abbott slide um, record, that was like published, you know, like many years ago, but this was like a theory, like this, you know, fact about, you know, like the thrombus and the turbulence, this was just a draw, it was just a pain, so nobody proved it up to now that actually this, these simulations are from here, you know, like um, Jordi, I don't know who did exactly if you, you know, the team, the whole team, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't know, you know, but I know that it's, this is a teamwork, you know, that's for sure, because otherwise this is impossible. And you can see here that, you know, like the watchman that is implanted deep, not covering the, the, the reach at all, and a, a watchman that, um, that is implanted proximal, you know, trying to minimize this area, you know, has an impact, definitely a, a, a large impact here, and this is like the same for the amulet. You know, like for us, maybe you can see it very, very fast, but you know, like for us it's difficult. So it's better when you just show, you know, the data, you know, like um, in, a, in a more steady, you know, like picture, um, where you can see here that the velocities here, you know, are or where, you know, much lower, um, suggesting that probably these areas are areas where you can have like a higher risk of device-related thrombosis. But it's always possible to cover the pulmonary reach. The fact is that it's sometimes it's not possible. Um, with, you know, like without experience, you can, you know, achieve, you know, a coverage of 60%, and with experience, you know, around 80 to 90%. But that's why, you know, um, softwares like Vida, and other stuff, I think that, you know, may help to optimize this thing. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you how, you know, like in real practice, um, you know, those simulations and, and the fact that covering the pulmonary reach um, might be important. So in this case, it's like a, a case of, you know, like an LA occlusion, like a real case where you can see like the, the appendage has different sizes. Like it, this is not important, you know, like for the, for the topic. Um, these are, you know, like the, the sizes, and then we end up, you know, like choosing this, this device, AMOLED 22. This is the deployment of the AMOLED, where you can see here the lobe, and then, you know, like after that, you know, like the, the disc. And here you can see, you know, on the next slide, that the disc, it's not covering the, the ridge. So most of the times, what you need to do is just pull back from the disc, and if the size, you know, predicted by, you know, like uh, I say, you know, like softwares like, like um, POP data and all this stuff, you know, it's working, you know, you can see that it's enough, you know, to cover the reach. And this is like a good position and then we unscrew and, and we will release the, the device. <coughs> Here. And that's a very good result, you know, like a flat, you know, and nice, you know, um, surface over the, the, the device to avoid this turbulence, these low velocities, and this is like what we, what we aim. Other um, cases, like this one, I'm gonna go fast, where you can see here that, you know, like this is the appendage, and we open the lobe here. This lobe is for the ones that you don't know, this lobe has the anchors, so this is like the active part that, you know, like um, actually, you know, um, hooks to the walls of the appendage. And here you can see that the aspect, you know, like the appearance of the device, it's, it's quite good. But then when you analyze again, you know, you can see that it's not good because it's not um, covering the reach. So in the past, for sure, or even like right now, you know, I am sure that maybe some operators will leave it, but we know that this is not good. And if we can modify, you know, like this factor, you know, like we know 
that those patients, you know, are gonna have like less risk of having thrombosis. So we are obliged, in a sense, to modify. How we modify this? By changing the coaxiality. So as you can see here, you know, like the, the coaxiality of the loop is different and changing that, and I'm gonna show you and comparing before and um, later, you can see that the disc, it's covering this ridge. And if you compare the position of the lobe before and after, you can see that here, the lobe, in a sense, it's you know, like pulling the disc inside. So that's why the ridge is going inside. But in he this case, you are completely coaxial, so you have you know, like a perfect coverage. Again, this is something that can be anticipated, predicted, or pre-planned with you know, like softwares, that, um, like the ones that you are working with. And for example, this is another situation. This is a situation that probably, I would say that it's almost impossible to cover the pulmonary ridge. So in this case, you can see that it's super prominent, super prominent here, and especially in this image. You can anticipate that if you put a disc, you're gonna end up in the mitral, over the mitral valve. So in this case, we don't you know, like push too much, and what we try to do is just try to be as proximal as possible, like in this case. And again, I'm gonna go fast, you know, not to worry you. Like this one, you know, that, that's the position, super coaxial, as you can see, you know, to avoid, you know, that the disc is not going in. And here you can see that, of course, it's like almost cover, but it's not cover because it's, you know, like below the pulmonary ridge. But the fact of being so coaxial allows to have no those triangles, but, you know, like this, uh, this flat or rounded surface that we know that it's gonna, it's gonna be good for, for device or um, thrombus and prevention. So in a sense, you know, like the best way to cover the pulmonary ridge is measuring not only the landing area, but also the ostium. So this is something that um, needs to be done, and this is something that you, you are already done. Of course, like flow simulations are really good um, in this sense. Also, um, the fact of being coaxial, this can lob, um, are also super important, and four, uh, appendages, this is like a courtesy of Dr. Lam, that it's the, the inventor of the Lambre. And, and I think that it's very illustrative, and I like, you know, like the drawing, because it's like manual, but it's just only showing that for the same landing zone, that it's 20, and um, having, you know, different ostiums is gonna, you know, like probably translate into different, you know, like um, optimal devices. I, of course, if you have like a larger ostium, you might need a 25. But if you have like a small ostium, you don't want just to interfere with the mitral, probably a 22 would be enough. So this is something um, that maybe we've not been doing like since now, but for the future, we will have to, to, to be doing for sure because it's not, not a matter of the, uh, of the landing zone embolization. It's also a matter of the ostium and, and the entrance of the, of the appendage. So for, for the ones that know the stents, you know, um, this is very similar to the stent thrombosis. When you have like a, a stent thrombosis, that this is like a life threatening that can kill you, you know, because it, it produces like a STEMI, like a heart attack. And there are like three factors that probably play a role in, you know, having the, or not having the stent thrombosis. The opposition of the stent, you know, that you can optimize with IBUS, OCT, and other intravascular stuff. The prothrombotic state, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, coagulation disorders, this is something that is there, but at the end you cannot change. And of course, the antithrombotic strategy post 10. The treatment that we're gonna give, you know, like for these three months, like the ones that I show you at the beginning, a Pixaban, you know, like aspirin. But at the end, those patients are gonna end up, you know, with, you know, like probably aspirin, all of them. <clears throat> for the appendage, it's exactly the same. You know, like the stena position would be like the device positioning. The prothrombotic pro state cannot be changed. And the antithrombotic um, strategy, the treatment, can be done for three months, but at the end, you know, um, the rest of the, of the life of the patient would be not covered for that. So, since, you know, the device, it's the thing that it's gonna remain, it's super important that it has the optimal position, because this cannot be changed. And then, if we have like a patient, you know, with a prothrombotic state, and for those ones, this, this, this um, factor, this position would be even more important. So um, recently, we analyzed, and I'm gonna finish you know, like, um, very soon, um, 1,000 patients, and uh, with Watchman, this Watchman means single lobe, and double lobe, it's amulet, or lambre, 
and we analyze um, pa patients with a covered pulmonary reach, okay? Like this one, that the, that the uh, in a sense that the watch one was, you know, like just at the level of the pulmonary reach, not covered, but at the level, or just um, covering. And this one that it's not covered, you can see here that you have this area, and also an amulet that you have this area. Just please note, because then I'm gonna talk um, later, that the, um, the watchman is not pushing, you know, the lobe of the watchman, it's not pushing the reach in general. But the disc of the amulet, if it falls inside, usually pulls, you know, the reach and creates these angulations that actually it's like a really, uh, I would say like a worse situation, a worse angle. So these are the clinical characteristics. I'm not gonna stop on that. The, the antithrombotic strategy post LIA was similar among um, the, the two groups, the patients that have covered PR and not covered pulmonary reach. And you know, the procedural outcomes, the clinical outcomes were the same, you know, like I mean, uh, complications and um, vascular access complication tamponades, meaning that if you are looking for, you know, like uh, pulmonary reach coverage, maybe you will have to recapture a little bit more unless it's very well, well pre-planned. But this seek for the perfection for the optimization and did not translate into more pericardial effusion or more embolization. So it means that it can be, it can be done. So these are the clinical outcomes. But when we analyze the device related thrombosis, you can see here that the rate of cover and non-cover, you know, had a super or super clear impact on, you know, the rate of um, DRT. So if you have a watchman and you're not covering the reach, you're gonna have like a DRT rate of 11, and for the amulet it's even higher, 14. Where is, if you are, in a sense, covering the pulmonary reach, and um, the rates of both, you know, devices are gonna be like really low. And this was a, an independent predictor, the fact of um, covering the pulmonary reach, um, with, you know, like the fact of not giving antithrombotic treatment. Not giving antithrombotic treatment or giving aspirin, it's like, it's like uh, something that um, we just like modify for the patient. If a patient has like an intracranial bleeding that can kill, you know, the patient, you're not gonna give anticoagulation to prevent DRT. It, this is like something would be like something stupid. So sometimes you cannot give antithrombotic treatment. So for, for this, it's super important that for those patients with such a high risk of, you know, like bleeding, because it's life treating or forever, I wa for whatever, that you cannot give antithrombotic treatment, you know, the fact of having like optimal position, it's even more important for them for avoiding MDRT. But what about, um, you know, like, um, should we treat this pulmonary rich covered as a, you know, like qualitative, you know, like um, variable? L yes, no, should we measure it? So it's, it's clear that it's, this is not the same than this. So, in a sense, um, this is what we analyze in this, in this paper, in this analysis. So we measure the distance between the disc and the ridge, the area and the angulation with both the amulet and the watchman. And what we saw is that the more um, deep you were in the appendage, the higher rate of um, the right rate of thrombosis you have. No, like up to a 16 if you are like really deep inside the appendage. This was the same for, uh, for the area. Um, the, ang the angulation like did not had an impact, but I think that, that has an impact uh, as I will show you. And if we analyze a watchman and amulet like in a different way, what we saw is that for the watchman, you know, like probably be close to the, to the, to the reach, it's fine, you know, like the would say the significant changes are gonna be seen over you know, 10 millimeters when you go more than 10 millimeters inside the appendage. And the other thing that it's important, it's you know, for the, um, the watchman, the importance of having like an angulation, like an open angulation was more important than the, than the amulet. For the amulet, for the amulet we saw like a more, you know, like just like I would say a progressive you know, relationship Whereas, you know, like um, if the disc was not covering the reach, we had like an increasing, you know, like rate of the bite related thrombosis. And um, the more the more deep you were, like the worse. And for the angulations, you know, that's why I, I, I highlight, you know, like the first the first slide. And um, if you remember the fact of having like a, a, a close or like a narrow angle and um, was worse, you know? 
So if you had like less than 90%, you know, like of, of angulation with a ridge, you had like a really high rate of, of the right related thrombosis. So basically just to end up, um, just to let you know that pulmonary ridge coverage is a predictor of DRT. Um, sometimes it's not possible to cover, but you need to try to look for it. Austin diameters should be measured to increase coverage rates and low disc coaxiality improve the, the pulmonary ridge coverage. Pre-planning software might be very useful to predict device positioning, so FIOPS, Trimentos, and VIDA, especially when you um, implement this functional information. That for me, that's the key. And patients should be assessed in a global manner to determine the need of peer um, pulmonary rich coverage. So if we have like a, a lot of you know, um, predictors of DRT that cannot not be modifiable, we should like um, pursue, we should try to, to be perfect and positioning the, the device. And that was it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Javier. It was really, really inspiring. Any question from the audience? No, I have a, I have a lot. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, whatever. I mean, we can just discuss in general, but I mean, you have shown that with very simple anatomical uh, metrics, or morphological metrics, you can already see if things are wrong. Why do you need simulations? Well, um, basically, it's, um, this is I mean, you have this distance, this angle. I mean, yeah. do you think that the simulations are going to give you something beyond this? For sure, yes. First of all, that it's, um, um, we have like now a lot of experience and uh, in a sense, you know, like we built all this, but you need to think that, you know, like left it up and the occlusion. Um, at the beginning, we start with 15 patients a year, and now um, I think that this year has exploded. It's gonna be like maybe 100. So in, in the future, I think that it's, that's gonna be, you know, like um, even more than that. And you might think that a lot of people will be doing that. You know, like experts, non-experts, people with, you know, like more experience, people, you know, like more skilled, people less skilled. So the fact of, you know, like just um, pre-plan and make, you know, like a, an easy plan and the operator can anticipate the position, not only anticipate, but also search for, you know, like an optimal position that in a sense, for example, if we're talking about flow simulations that provides the best I would say profile in terms of you know like um, high velocities or, or lower turbulence. That's gonna be important because it's like the one that I show you before. No, um, I mean sometimes you don't want just to move the device, but if you know like the simulation, it's telling you that this is the way to go because this is gonna be associated with that less risk of thrombus. So then you will have to move it, and mm. and I think that you know like it has a lot of room in the future. Mm. What's your opinion uh, on these new conformable devices that apparently they can just expand <laughs> and, and, and really conform to the geometry of a given left hatchal appendage? That's kind of ideal, no? Or well, you know, like the, the, the devices have improved a lot, uh, but at the end, you know, like those devices, the one that I know, and um, they don't have disc. For me, you know, like just I think that the that the disc of the fact of you know like getting a full coverage of the appendage, it's probably super important. And um, one device fits all means that less control. So because it's gonna you know like just and have you know like probably borders you know like course that you know it's gonna be there and it's gonna stay there and it's not gonna embolize but I'm not so sure that you will have to have different you know like sizes disc to try to adapt you know mm -hmm. like the uh, you know th those you know like devices I, I think that um, they are of course interesting but at the end you know, like th they're gonna be some planning and some some sizing mm -hmm. yeah even with and those and obviously you have discussed a lot about device implantation. What do you see potential for these tools to be used as a, for a screening? Like more, okay, just to predict the risk of thrombus? I mean, uh, for, I mean, for, for example, like now one of the, of the problems that, you know, like most of the, of the 
you know, like no, no disclosure, but I mean that, that most of the of those softwares have, that for example, if you ask, I mean, just provide me an analysis between Watchman, Amulet, Lambre, which one it's gonna fit the best, you know, and which one it's gonna, you know, like, and provide, you know, like the best profile for flow dynamics. So, like companies are not gonna do that, you know, like they're not allowed, you know, just to do that. They analyze just only for Amulet, you know, for Watchman, but just this, they don't compare. But at the end, I think that this is gonna be, you know, like the, you know, like just the way to go. Probably, if we are demonstrating that, you know, like in some anatomies, it's impossible to cover the pulmonary ridge because it's too prominent, maybe in those, instead of using an amulet that has a disc that it's more flat, maybe you, we, we should use an a watchman that it's more rounded. Yeah. And the watchman needs to go very proximal and maybe in a position that it's not easy just to, to achieve. So that's why I think that, you know, those comparisons um, are gonna be important in the future. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're working on, on that or you mm -hmm. know, just... Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are not in a company. Uh, Simona, you wanted to answer question. Okay, thank you for your, your presentation and uh, this uh, general overview on this, all the problem related. Uh, um, I don't want to, to change the focus, but uh, I think that you have shown uh, to us another important uh, uh, concept. The relation, the distance, the relationship between the appendages and mitral valve. Um, moreover, you say that uh, y y y well, we, we know what you, you, you focus this atten the, um, attention, that uh, in the last years, the device has changed a lot. I think that in particular, the watchman. In the first release of the watchman, the, the device was very stiff. Now it's more compliant. In your experience, did you find uh, uh, alteration uh, a modification of the mitral valve after closure? No, I mean, so this is like something that um, like a lot of people talk about, but there's only one report, you know, published in JAXCI, I'm showing this at erosion. Like, I don't know anybody that has seen it. You know, like a real interaction, a real disruption, you know, between a disc and, and, and you know, the mitral valve. That's why, you know, when, you know, like the fact of covering the pulmonary ridge obliges you just to put such a large disc that it's gonna interact and you're not gonna use it. So um, in real practice, this is like a really, you know, like just tiny problem. But the thing is that um, if we are moving to a more proximal aspect, because now we were like living and working more distal because we were concerned about demolizations. But if we are saying this, that we need to go more and more and more proximal, this might become a problem. So that's why we need to think. And you know, I completely agree with you that you know, Watchman Flex, it's like another history. It's like a game changer. And and you know, like there are anatomies that you know, like the, the mitral valve, it's really close to the to the appendage. That for those maybe you know, like just putting a Watchman might have you know, like an impact. But for this, you know, like it's also important, you know, like and the fact of higher simulation. Because again, you know, if you have a lot of experience. You might see it, and then you're gonna see the ridge, the mitral valve. But if 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 not, you know, like this is something that might you know like happen, and and then you you don't know, and something that can be predicted. And another concept that I just want just to to let you know it's that today we did like um, usually we now we are doing like between four and five appendages a day, okay? And you know like um, in sedation without general anesthesia, that means that. Um, Probably it's around half an hour, uh, and with the patient being, you know, like on the on the bed, and 15, 20 minutes of procedure, and just to achieve that and go fast, you need to have everything planned before. So you just put the micro to the, tr the transeptal and to check the device is in good position. I don't see, um, I don't do anxious anymore. I don't do anything. It's everything pre-planned. So again, the fact of have a good pre-plan. If it's cheap, <laughs> if it, no, if it's no, I, I would say that if it's like something that it's easy, um, then, um, and then and and it's there available and for everybody, that would be really useful. The the other thing is that um, you know it, it it has to be convenient just to be to be used. But now, 
we go to the cath lab with everything planned. We know the position and we know the, the exact um, size of the device and, the, and, and you know, like the, 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 the orientation that we want. That's true. That's true. Uh, so thank you very much, Javier. It was wonderful. And thank you very much, everyone that has participated. We don't have time just for overall discussions. Uh, in the end, it was very good review of a lot of nice work. And we need to grow from this and see if there is potential and synergies and ways to do things together.